Good morning, everyone. Can I ask you to take your seats, please? We're going to get ourselves started. Jeff, can you come up and write? And Mustafa, you might as well come on up, too. Good morning, everyone. My name is Renice Miller Travis, and I am going to be your uh, facilitator and moderator. We um, had a wonderful, wonderful opening session last night. How many people were able to be at the opening session last night? It was really, really, really something to hear from some of the leading lights of EJ and social justice in North Carolina. I understand that people had an extraordinary time on the very long um, site tour to see. There's so many things to see in North Carolina to put it in perspective. Um, we could have spent the whole weekend just doing that, right? But we really wanted to set the context yesterday for what the conversation is about, what are the challenges that communities are facing, how are communities making themselves resilient, and what are folks doing that can be replicated in other communities around the country. Um, and so we, we thought we really stepped significantly into that conversation last night, and today we're going to take that um, even further. And so I'd like to ask Jeff Onstead to give us our traditional welcome. Good morning. Where I come from, we say Bilahok. Bilahok. That means good morning, hello. My name is Jeff Anstead. I'm a citizen of the Halawasaponi Indian tribe, which is located in the northern eastern section of North Carolina. Our tribe um, consists of about 4,000 citizens. We're the third largest tribe in the state of North Carolina. We're the only tribe in the state of North Carolina that operates a state chartered school. So we educate our children right in our communities, which is very important. I'm so happy to be here today. Um, in the state of North Carolina, I wear many hats or custodians. I'm an Indian commissioner for the state with the North Carolina Commission of Indian Affairs. I was appointed to the DEQ Advisory Committee back last year, and I believe in working for our people. We always believe in seven generations. That's the way we think. As Indian people from the time of contact, we always prepared for seven generations. In 2019, it's, more, it's, it's the most important time for us to plan for our next seven generations. Because if we don't, they're not going to enjoy this earth as we know it. Um, state of North Carolina has eight recognized tribes. The Halawasaponi, the Lumbee tribe, the Kahari Indian tribe, the Wakamasuan tribe, the Meharian tribe, the Okaneechee Band of Saponi Tribe and the Saponi Tribes, and the Eastern Band of Cherokee. We also have four Indian urban, urban organizations, Triangle Native Organization in Raleigh, Metrolina Native Organization in Charlotte, Gifford Native Organization in Greensboro, and um, one more, Cumberland County Association for Indian People in Fayetteville. State of North Carolina, like I said, has the biggest population of Indian people east of the Mississippi, which is something that probably 80% of this population doesn't know, that we're still here. We're still living on traditional lands. You know, where I live, our traditional land, um, we sort of migrated there. We were put on a fort one time, Fort Christiana, up in Lawrenceville, Virginia, where we were taught Christianity ways, we were taught English, um, and, but we left. We left that fort because uh, it wasn't a good thing for our people. Um, we're very traditional people. Um, we have always educated our people. From the 1800s of having Secret Hill Indian School, to Bethlehem Indian School, to present day Halawasaponi Indian School. We always believe in the education of our people. I'm glad to be here today. I just left a unity conference in Raleigh where we had over 250 participants at this unity conference. It was great medicine for me. Um, I'm gonna share with you some traditional songs. 
Uh, in these songs, I'm going to give a honoring to each person here. And in one song, I'm going to give you a traveling song. We believe in our life, we, we take a journey. We go through our ceremonies and we take a journey. But we have to take a song with us. We have to take a protection song. We have to take a song of guidance. And I believe everybody needs to understand that. You have to have your song of guidance. You have to be true to yourself. You can't get wrapped up in the corporate world. You've got to be true to yourself. That's what's going to make the difference in this world. You know, we've got a lot of things coming into North Carolina that's devastating. We, we live in a state where we need stronger laws. We need legislation to stand up and, and um, pass laws that's protection of our lands and protection of our people. And we're working on that. Uh, right now, I'm going to share a little bit with you guys, and uh, I'm just so happy to be here today. Um, I'm so glad to uh, walk into a room and, and feel so welcome. Uh, we, as Indian people, uh, we need to work harder at including ourselves within all the organizations in the state. Uh, to be a part of it and let people hear our stories and understand who we are and where we come from. We are the indigenous people. We are the original inhabitants of this land, and we still are the protectors of this land. So thank you. Yo! song I never ended this song so this song is for you don't let your visions and your passion end continue but be true to your heart thank you very much for having me I invite all of you here to our powwow which is the third weekend in April it's the oldest and the largest powwow in the state of North Carolina we come from a very rural community we're 30 miles from anywhere we come from a community that is intentionally um, targeted for projects like the Atlantic Coast Pipeline um, and other things. But we invite you out. Uh, we got a commission on Indian Affairs here in Raleigh. You can go to the commission site and you can look at all the tribes in the state and also all the activities. We stay very busy. But if you have time, third weekend of April, Come down and see our people. Come down and see our little ones of the schools that we have and the things we have in our community. Thank you very much. Be La Hope to each and every one here, and thank you again.
Thank you, Jeff, for truly putting us in context about where we are um, and the history of the people who came here, who were here, and who set this table that we're fighting for now. How many, Jeff, are these your glasses? Next, I'd like to ask um, Reich Longest to come and give us a welcome. Reich is the director of the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic here at Duke Law School and our host, um, and also a clinical professor um, of law here at Duke Law School, Reich? Thank you all, and welcome from Duke University to each and every one of you. Um, I also wanted to just talk a little bit about some of the organizations and most importantly the people that are here with those organizations who have helped make today possible. This particular symposium is co-presented with the Duke Integrated Toxicology and Environmental Health Program. Every time I mention an organization, I'd like for the people who are associated with that organization to stand. So the people who are here with the Duke Integrated Toxicology and Environmental Health Program, please stand up so we can say hello. I do not believe anybody is here today from the Duke Office of Faculty Advancement, um, but that was one of the uh, generous grant sponsors which allowed us to design a symposium that was community focused and community centered. And so I want to definitely thank them as well. And then we have some co-sponsors who are here um, today. So Bennett College, so Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson. Yes. The Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. I know we've got some Yale folks here. All right. Vermont Law School is definitely here. Yeah, I understand you all had a good chance to enjoy Durham last night, so that's great. <laughs> the Environmental Law Clinic at Columbia. So I know we got Marion, no? Let's hear, okay, well, anyway. And the Union of Concerned Scientists, yeah. So UCS and VLS have tables back there. I would invite you also to look at the table back there where we have also some um, information about the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic and most importantly, uh, some articles from the latest issue of the North Carolina Medical Journal um, involving some of the topics that we've been looking at recently. Now this symposium was designed, our steering committee decided that we needed to make sure that we also had a planning committee. So we're going to talk about a little bit about who those people are. So Dr. Adrian Hollis, yes, again. Denise Abdul-Rahman, yes. Um, A.O. Wilson, thought I saw him. Well, he was here last night, yeah, there we go. Um, Dr. Raji, you're here, I saw you, yes, there we go. Uh, Jameson Davis, yeah. Dr. Valerie Ann Johnson. And Dr. Nancy Lauer, back there. Oh, over there. And most importantly, uh, I wanted to make sure to give a warm thank you to the person who left herself off this list, and that's Claire Herman. Um, please, all of us. Author, author. It was Claire's vision and Claire's um, re constant reminders to me in a gentle way uh, to be true to the principles that we set forth. Um, that helped me uh, as I was trying to make sure to honor the principles that we set up for uh, this symposium. And we hope that this will be a, a set of principles that we can use going forward in all of our interactions with uh, community members and among community faculty. Because the reality is the types of silos that we create for ourselves, with the organizations to which we belong, with the titles that we put on, with the jackets that we wear, um, all of those things are things that separate us. But there only is one planet. This is the only one we know of that is our home, and it's all our home, and we are here together to learn how to work in community with one another, and we better get used to getting along with one another regardless of where we came from or what silo we may be affiliated with. So I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being here today, and uh, we're now going to form, storm, norm, and perform. All right. <laughs> thank you, Reich. And it's true, um, Claire has been just the central organizing force that has marshaled um, everything and everybody. And um, 
it has been a pleasure, Claire, really, to, to uh, partner with you in this effort. So without further ado, let me introduce our keynote for this morning. Uh, Mustafa Santiago Ali um, is currently, and let's see if I can get this title, Vice President at the National Wildlife Federation for Environmental Justice and Climate Resilience, or Climate Justice. Yes? Say that what? And community revitalization. Let's not leave out the community revitalization. Um, I have known Mustafa since, I think, 1993, um, maybe a little before that. But when did you first go to EPA? End of 91. So I've known him since 1991 and have watched him grow in this work and to see him grow and maintain his integrity while working at the Environmental Protection Agency through the dark days and the bright days and the dark days and then back to the really, really dark days. Um, and you all might remember, he told me something last night, and he's a really good friend of mine and I talk to him all the time, but he told me something last night that was startling. So you may remember that um, early in the transition to this current administration, um, a lot of people left EPA, but Mustafa was one of the first people to leave EPA and to say out loud, I'm leaving because I don't think this president and this administration um, and the leadership of EPA care about environmental protection or care about environmental justice or care about environmental enforcement and equal protection before the law. So I'm out. But before I go, let me tell you all what we have done and what you could do. And then he left. Um, and in that interregnum period when he left, to go to the Hip Hop Caucus, um, he got lots of death threats. And last night was the first time he mentioned that to me. So when people are stepping out and doing this work, um, a lot of times it's so much deeper than the policy or the advocacy or the litigation um, or the scientific research that we all undertake. But for a lot of people who do this work, they put their hearts and souls on the line to do it every day, right? And to sacrifice whatever needs to be sacrificed. And so. Um, there's so much more I could say about Mustafa, but integrity um, is something that he walks with and lives with on a daily basis. Um, standing up for justice is something he walks with and lives with on a daily basis. And bringing justice to folks, shining a light on what's happening around the country. Um, and now we're going to see what he's really made of and see if he can change the ship of the National Wildlife Federation. Without further ado, Mustafa Ali. I'm good. I don't know if I'm that good to tell y'all the truth, but we're going to try. Um, most of y'all know me. Let me see if I can get this to work. I have no idea. Because I'm not good at standing behind these things. How's everybody doing? Y'all going to make me take the jacket off already, right? How's everybody doing? Good. All right. I just want to do a couple of quick things. One, two people have talked about Claire. We need to give Claire a round of applause. Please give her a round of applause. Yes, y'all should actually stand up, and I'm going to tell you why. Claire is a saint. I'm going to tell you all why. If any of y'all know me and you know how crazy my schedule is, Claire never got shook one time. At least I didn't know about it. She would call, and then she'd be like, I'm sure Mustafa will call me back sometime in the next three, four months. And she was just fantastic, and along with all the other folks who helped to pull this together. So I just want to say thank y'all. I also want to give a shout out to, I guess I'm part of the alumni at Vermont Law School. So if y'all could give them another round of applause holding it down. Um, and it's an honor and it's a blessing to be here with y'all. I see so many familiar faces in the room. You're going to see some uh, photos that will be sliding by. Um, they are to actually anchor you. It's not about the words that folks share with you. It's about the reality of what's actually happening on the ground, the deeds that are happening, intended, sometimes unintended, and sometimes focused on actually extracting wealth from communities and extracting their health. So those are the most important. Along with the folks who are here in the room with you, you have a wealth of knowledge. And for the students and others who say that you are serious about working on environmental justice and climate justice issues, if you are not tapping into these incredible leaders who have been doing this work for decades now, then you are missing a prime opportunity. It's like having that one professor that you've always wanted to take their course. You have that opportunity here 
and I hope that you take advantage of it. I have given thousands of presentations now, and folks know that I always give honor to my mother and my grandmother, who are the rocks that I stand on, and who also help to prepare me. If you are working on civil rights issues, if you are working on social justice issues, if you are working on environmental justice issues, or public health issues, you may have some tough days. How many folks in the room have ever had a tough day? Raise your hand. Everybody hold your hand up high. Find that person who never had a tough day, just run over and touch them real quick. <laughs> it's important because you need that energy. My mother and my grandmother, especially me being a young man of color, told me, and folks who know me know what I'm about to share with you, that yes, you're gonna have some tough days, but you're gonna have to figure out how to deal with those tough days if you're gonna be serious about the issues that you are working on. So my mother and my grandmother told me to find some words of empowerment. I've used these every day since I've been 16 years old, except for two times. I'll talk to you all about those two times and then you can blame on me what happened those two times, maybe just one time. But every day I get up, I look in the mirror and I say I'm blessed and highly favored. Now I know I'm in the South, so I know somebody in here can recognize what I'm talking about. I should tell y'all also, folks don't know, I was raised in a family of Baptist and Pentecostal ministers. How many folks know anybody who's Baptist or Pentecostal? Raise your hand. All right, we got a few heathens in the house, I see. But everybody try it with me. I'm blessed and highly favored. All the folks who went to the club last night, I'm blessed and highly favored. All right, and this last time, we're gonna actually say it like we mean it, like we actually expect positive energy to surround us. I'm blessed and highly favored. And you are. And the reason that you are is because you have an opportunity to actually make real change happen, to stand in solidarity with communities and use your expertise to support the work that can make positive change. Sometimes we forget about that because lots of times we go to school, we get a bunch of letters after our name and we begin to think about all the debt that we have and we begin to accept jobs and positions just to pay that off instead of following what your passion is and the ability to actually make real change happen. You feel me on that? And I get $80,000, $100,000, $200,000 in debt, and you have to make some decisions about how and where you want your life to go. Am I going to go work for a big firm and spend 80, 90 hours a week researching for someone? That's just reality for some folks. That's the path that they go down. Or you can begin to change some dynamics. You can begin to be an individual like Luke Cole. Someone, how many folks know who Luke Cole was? So if you are an attorney, or hoping to be an attorney, and you have not raised your hand, and you say that you care about environmental and climate issues, you need to pull your phone out and start Googling. He was one of the greats, along with a gentleman by the name of Grover Hankins, who helped at the Thurgood Marshall Law Center. I think I said that properly. There are so many incredible folks who have given their lives from the legal sense to help to make real change happen. So as I have grown in these issues, being surrounded by many of the incredible folks in this room and others across the country, I began to think much more critically about environmental justice, environmental injustice, where it actually started. What is sort of the foundation in that space? And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We're gonna talk about some of the impacts that are happening, some of the communities across the country, but we also need to be extremely focused on our own power and how we make real change happen. And there are numbers of communities across the country who you don't see on CNN or MSNBC who never get the spotlight but continue to do the hard work and are making real change happen. Is that all right with everyone? So let's go back to when this all really began. So from the first day, some people say 1619, it was actually 1539, the first time African Americans or Africans actually made it to our shores, and that was in Florida. But you can go to Virginia in 1619. You saw that first slide where you actually saw the hands with the chains, right? So environmental injustices began as soon as slaves came off the ship. And it's okay for us to go back and take a look at that. That is not holding anyone in this room accountable for those sins, but we have to understand what happened. As soon as they came off of those ships, they were taken away from their culture, right? They were placed on plantations, given some of the hardest work to do. So when we talk about jobs and justice, now, we're thinking back to those times when people were not paid, of course, for the work that was happening. They were placed in some of the most dangerous jobs. Does that make sense to everyone? So when you're talking about environmental justice, environmental injustice, understand the platform of where we're coming from. Go back to Native American brothers and sisters. 
and how in many instances they were removed from their land, moved in many instances away from cultural practices, cultural food, so everybody who talks about food justice now understand the history behind what was happening in that space. Does that make sense to everyone? And a number of other things were happening. Some folks who often get forgotten in our conversation is our Asian and Pacific Islander brothers and sisters. You saw a slide that I intentionally put on there because everybody wants to talk about infrastructure now. Well, who helped to build the infrastructure in our country? Slaves were one group, right? Indigenous brothers and sisters played a role. But Asian brothers and sisters also, especially Chinese Americans, played a significant role in the building of our infrastructure in the sense of our railroads, right? And our canal system. Some people don't know about that. And what happened in that dynamic was that, again, they were pulled away from traditional practices. If people began to do their own traditional practices, they were looked down on. There were all kinds of different laws that were put in place and a number of other things, moved from foods, and given some of the most dangerous jobs, if you go back and look at who was leading some of the blasting that was going on and some of the other things in that space, it was Chinese um, brothers and sisters at that time. So you also saw the slide of Warren County, North Carolina, which for us is the flashpoint. Some people also talk about 1968 and Dr. King when he was dealing with the Sanitation Workers March, and many of you understand that dynamic. We say Warren County, um, and everybody knows Warren County's just down on the other side and, and what happened in that space. What I really appreciate there is the visuals. And you saw one of the slides that was there of folks laying down in the road. And I want to remind you all, the civil rights movement was a lot of young people as well who are leading that. So people now talk about all the incredible energy that's going on. There is a history that has took place that we should always remember. And then you will also see a number of young people who were there in Warren County with elders as well because in environmental justice, we have an intergenerational movement who also were laying down in those roads, trying to stop those trucks from bringing in those PCBs and those cancer-causing chemicals into that community. So that's a part of our foundation. But there are a lot of smart folks in the room. Everybody in the room was blessed to go to high school? Raise your hand if you went to high school. So every person in this room. Some of our folks were blessed to be able to go to college. We have all these letters after our names. And when we sit down with community groups, we want to let folks know how much we know. I'm guilty. When I first started, one of the first meetings I went to, I'm like, oh, I, I went to school and I know a couple of things. And I remember I went to a meeting in Louisiana and there was an elder in the community, wonderful lady. And I stood up and I said a few words. And then she said, Mustafa, she said, baby, we don't care about your degrees. She said, what we care about is if you're going to actually be here and you're actually going to stay focused and you're going to honor what we're talking about. And the reason I share that with you is because sometimes when we start talking about air pollution and water pollution and pollution of the land, we want to share with folks every scientific fact that we might know and forget about how and what is actually going on in their lives. So let me share this with you. How many folks in the room, because I want to simplify it, how many folks in the room, by a show of hands, have taken a breath of air in, let's say, the last 60 seconds? Raise your hand if you breathe some air in the last 60 seconds. Raise your hand up high. I want everybody to see it. Everybody find the non-air breathers. Why? It's like a silly question, Mustafa. Why are you asking me that question? It's an autonomic response. It's something that all of us do. But unfortunately, sometimes we forget the dynamic that's actually happening in communities. We got 200,000 people in our country who are dying prematurely from air pollution. If we had 200,000 people who were dying from something else, there would be a huge amount of attention that would be on that, right? So what's going on in that space? We have places like Southwest Detroit. How many folks have been to Detroit? How many folks drove by Detroit? <laughs> OK, because some people look like they weren't sure if they should be going by Detroit. You have folks who are living next to the Marathon Refinery and some of the other polluting facilities that are there. And when children wake up and they look out their window, instead of them seeing the beautiful scenery that we have here, they see facilities. They see stacks. And when they try and take a breath of air, they're not getting what you just got. Everybody do me a favor. Take a deep breath. Let it out. When we take that in, we assume that something positive is going into our bodies, right? But far too many communities are not receiving that. 
in our country. That's what I want to anchor with you all. We have this slogan about the United States or America being the greatest country on the planet. If we say that, shouldn't we have to live up to that ideal? So how do we have so many people who are dying from air pollution? And we've seen the litany of uh, stories, reports, and analysis that have come out recently talking about all kinds of different things. Babies being born with smaller brains because of air pollution, dementia, Alzheimer's, all these different types of things. I can go down the laundry list of things. And you go to places like the Manchester community in Houston, Texas. How many folks have been to Houston? How many folks have been to the Ship Channel? Now, see, the, here's the dynamic. We got a whole bunch of folks in the room, and we're all family. So we say we care about these issues, but yet we are not wedded to what's actually happening. Why is the Manchester community important? It's like a number of communities. When you go there, how many folks in the room, watch this, how many folks in the room got an old car? Yeah, you know you're in a fancy place when only five people got an old car. <laughs> Keep your hands up if you got an old car. We're gonna see how old your car is. Oh, okay, some more people threw their hands up. They're like, let me just throw it up because other people put their hands up. <laughs> All the people with an old car. How many folks actually have a car that you got to roll the window down? <laughs> My man said, I got one of those. <laughs> He said, I ain't got that good job yet. Okay. What's your name, brother? Brandon. Brandon. Come here, Brandon. <laughs> you shouldn't have said your name, Brandon. Brandon, have a seat. Just on the hand up. He said, this was not on the handout. <laughs> Let me get close to Brandon, because we got a little subcompact old car, right? Brandon and I are driving. We're in Houston. We're moving down to the ship channel. We're going, you comfortable? I'm good. Okay. <laughs> He's rolling down the window as we pull up to the Manchester community. And the first thing that you breathe in, you feel like you're breathing in gasoline fumes. In the Manchester community. When Brandon looks out the window, he's like, Mustafa, what's going on? Because when you look out, all you see for miles and miles are petrochemical facilities. You saw a picture of Cesar Chavez High School. That's the picture that you saw the track and the school and you saw the flaring in the background. People who live in the Manchester community, and there's an incredible organization there called Tejas, Juan Paras runs that organization, along with a number of other incredible folks. If you go on people's back porch or front porch and you pick up a big rock, heavy rock, and you throw it, you would literally touch the piping that exists in these facilities. That's how close people live. And they are breathing it in every day. Cancers, liver disease, kidney disease, all kinds of bronchial related problems in the greatest country on the planet, contributing to the 200,000 people who are dying prematurely. But also, how is that possible? And we'll talk a little bit about zoning and restrictive covenances and redlining, all these things that drive certain people in certain places and move other people out of those places. Thank you, brother. Oh, thank you. Well, you can stay. Come on, man. You can hang out with me for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> nah, you all have to. <laughs> you everybody give Brandon a round of applause. You got to think about this dynamic. Here's the other thing. So when people come to you and start talking about, well, these environmental issues are not that serious. Right? We all love our military, correct? Or we support the military. All right. I heard that. I heard that. You saw another slide that not enough people talk about. That was the one that talks about how many people have died in our wars. Now, most folks in the room are young enough to remember the Iraq war and the Afghanistan wars that are still going on, correct? There are folks in the room who remember the Vietnam War and the Korean War. We don't have to go any further than that. You take the total number of individuals who have died in those wars, hold on to that for a second, and more people are dying every year prematurely from air pollution than died in those wars. But we give a huge amount of attention, and we should, to supporting our troops, but why don't we give the same amount of attention to the people who are dying prematurely from air pollution? Right? 
And ozone is now becoming a much more significant problem. It always has been because climate change is going to drive that, no pun intended, through the roof, okay? I want you to think about that. By a show of hands, in the last 24 hours, long time, right? Compared to 60 seconds. How many folks in the room have taken a drink of water or a beverage? Because I saw some of y'all last night. <laughs> Keep your hands up. Find the camels, find them. <laughs> Every person in this room has raised their hand. So this is where it gets real, real, especially here in North Carolina and lots of other places across the country. You all have seen the statistics that are going on in relationship to our water quality. Both those who are hooked up to systems and those who are getting their water from wells. There's some real scary stuff that's going on. And we have an administration that seems to be completely out of touch with what's going on. So Vernice talked about you know, me leaving and the various things in that space. For me, it was quite simple. And since there are a lot of attorneys in the room, and I was talking to another attorney yesterday about we need to start actually looking at culpability. I'll talk a little bit about that in the Flint context. But if we know these chemicals are impacting, making people sick, killing people, then for me, and again, I'm not a practicing attorney, but I see culpability if we are actually hurting people in that direction. Now, if I say Flint, how many folks know what happened in Flint, Michigan? I'm assuming almost every person in here. You understand the dynamics of children being exposed to lead, lowering IQ points, taking away future opportunities, causing all kinds of health problems. Of course, we saw the Legionnaire's disease that came out also um, in Flint. All these various dynamics that are going on in that space. But we forget that there are over 3,000 locations that have higher levels of lead in their water than Flint. We still have schools that are not properly testing. We have states that don't have the regulations in place to make sure that students are being protected. But it's growing in the sense that we now have, people are finally starting to pay attention to PFOS and PFOS and a number of the other things that are going on here. You guys saw at Camp Lejeune and you saw the slide of some of the exposures that some of the folks were dealing with there. We know the algae blooms that are continuing to grow and we know that there's a linkage that's there between some of the CAFOs and some of the farm runoff into our water bodies. And sometimes we forget how limited the amount of our drinking water actually is. Because when we take the shots from space and we see our planet is blue, we assume that there's plenty to go around. And some people would actually have you believe that because if we didn't think that there was plenty of water, then the waters of the US rule that folks work so diligently on and that has huge impacts here in North Carolina and across the country, folks would be supporting it. It's almost like when we were talking about the air-related issues, and you guys see that one. That one always trips me out, because most people would never think in a million years how much water it takes to actually make one T-shirt. But yet, we just buy, 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 throw away, buy, 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 throw away. And that seems to be the model that we've sort of taken on. Of course, our elders had a much different model, sometimes out of necessity, sometimes just out of basic common sense. But even going back to the air issues, when you see these folks talking about rolling back the clean power plant, and North Carolina doesn't have as many coal plants as some of the other locations do, but still have issues that were in that space, what kind of sense does that make if we know that people are getting sick, people are dying, and you are going to weaken those protections? And then we'll talk about climate change in a little bit. When we talk about the methane rule or the refinery rule, or some of the others that are out there that are making the opportunity for more people to get exposed to pollution, there has to be a linkage between the decisions that are being made and the impacts that are happening in people's lives. Does that make sense to everyone? And we can go down the list and, and talk about Superfund sites. You all know with all the flooding that came through. And let's just go back to the Manchester community. And let's go to Port Arthur, Texas also right there on the Gulf Coast. So when those hurricanes came through and those floods came through, they also began to breach those Superfund sites and move that pollution around. So people were getting what I often call the double and triple whammy in the communities that have environmental justice concerns. So the first one 
is the initial exposure, right? And we now have this conversation that's going on about existential threats, right? People talk about that in relationship to climate change. Have folks heard people use that language? This is the greatest challenge of our lifetime. Sometimes they forget in that sort of analysis that the majority of fossil fuel facilities are located where? In communities of color, low-income communities, and in indigenous land. And people for decades and decades and decades were saying, please pay attention because we're getting sick and we're being exposed. One. Two, pipelines. Where do those pipelines run? Communities of color, low-income communities, indigenous populations. You saw a slide, the Atlantic Coast Pipeline. But, you know, and we had a great conversation last night. How many folks, before you saw the slide, knew that there are 2.4 million miles of pipeline in our country? So two people, three people, four people. <laughs> four, 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 can I get five, five? <laughs> 2.4 million miles of pipeline. And we want to build more. And if you actually do an analysis of the pipelines, you'll find that many of them are nowhere near capacity. So they continue to build. The Atlantic Coast Pipeline, folks talked a little bit last night, starting in West Virginia. How many West Virginians are in the house? Yep, we don't get out much, do we? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I, I'm, a, I'm a West Virginian. Nobody believes me. I got an accent when I need it. I want you to think about something. So starting in West Virginia, running down through Virginia, here to North Carolina, I worked on a case that's still going on, or I'm working with folks, let me say it that way to be correct. There in a community that you saw on one of the slides that was founded by freed slaves. Freed slaves, right outside of Richmond, and folks have continued to try and stop this. The governor has not done what he's supposed to do in that space. A natural gas compressor um, is being placed in that community. And you guys have seen as the pipeline moves where people are trying to place the natural gas compressors. And there's all kinds of different dynamics that are going on in that space. It's not just about those compressors moving you know, those fossil fuels, that frack gas. It's also about the possibilities of explosions. It's also about breaching. I haven't seen any pipelines that there haven't been breaches. I'm, there may be some out there I've just not been aware of. Eventually, there's going to be a breach. So then folks have to deal with that. Here's the other thing. Because we talked about the fossil fuel facilities being located in the communities. We're talking about the pipelines being placed in those communities. How many folks follow homeland security related issues? So when I was on Capitol Hill, I used to do some stuff Benny Thompson at that time was the chairman of the Homeland Security Committee. He used to work across the hall. And we used to talk when we get in the elevator going to places. We used to talk about tier two targets. Tier two targets are those facilities we're talking about. They're talking about pipelines. And those are located in whose communities? So if there was an attack, once again, it is the most vulnerable communities who would have to deal with that dynamic and have to figure out. Omega and some other folks were talking last night about when we have these storms that come through and how in many instances folks are not prepared. We're also not prepared if someone did something in one of these sites. So how are we helping to protect and prepare communities for some of these impacts that go on? So with all these different types of challenges we have going on, there are also some bright lights that happen from the community side and also structurally. But it seems like every time we get something in place, someone loses their damn mind. I'm glad this is on film so they can hear what I'm about to say. So not only do we have an administration that continues to roll back all of the various things that folks in this room and across the country have been pushing for just to get some basic things in place. Enforcement actions are now down to just a very small percentage of what they were before. But we also on the state level got some folks who need to get their act together. In Virginia, 
We have a governor who's allowed air permits to be able to move forward impacting communities, right? I'm not taking away from any other positive thing that you may have done, but you have a responsibility to make sure that you are protecting the lives of communities. In North Carolina, I'm about to get in real trouble now. <laughs> There's an advisory board that was put in place for environmental justice that was supposed to help to make sure that the voices of communities had the ability to influence the process. And they had a great example in the sense that when folks look at the Environmental Protection Agency, I'll just take you back just a little bit real quickly. When you see some of the positive things that have come out of that agency, when you hear about the Office of Environmental Justice, when you hear about the Environmental Justice Small Grant Program, when you hear about Executive Order 12898 that President Clinton signed, the various other actions, the, um, you know, the uh, interagency working group that happened, those came out of sets of recommendations from communities. So there are a certain level of expectations and they've ebbed and flowed with the effectiveness and, and moving backwards and forwards, but it was always there. So, when the state of North Carolina puts together an advisory committee that the community and others are supposed to have a voice in helping to frame out what's happening, when we talk about the hog farms or the CAFOs, when we talk about these water quality issues, when we talk about these air quality issues, or even when we get focused on actually job creation in this space, then those advisory committees have to have the ability to be able to move the process. And now we have here some Funny business. Is that the way you would say it? Omega taught me that, funny business. <laughs> and it's gotta be addressed. So don't put things in place if you're not serious about making real change happen. And real change can happen. So everybody talks about this new, clean, green economy. We got the Green New Deal, but even before the Green New Deal, we had green zones that came from environmental justice organizations about changing the dynamics in their community, addressing the impacts, but also bringing resources and jobs back into the community. That is a part of our paradigm. The first part is dealing with the past and present impacts, but we're also focused on creating and moving what I've often said and others say, moving our most vulnerable communities from surviving to thriving. What does that look like? There are numerous examples. You can look at the work that Omega has been doing uh, in Mebane, but you can also look at places like in Kansas City with Miss Margaret May. You can look at the work of the Environmental Health Coalition that's happening in San Diego. I'm so glad that people are writing this down. Because you can't talk about environmental justice if you can't show how successes are happening. Because that's the first thing people are gonna ask you, what does success look like? So you've gotta be able to point that out as well of where we're trying to get to. And if you are someone who um, follows from a faith-based paradigm, then look at the work of Reverend Floyd Flake in Jamaica, Queens. Buster uh, Reverend Suarez um, in Jersey City. Look at the work of Bethel New Life in Chicago. Or you can look at the Regenesis Project in Spartanburg, South Carolina, which is not that far away. And it is not the only example but it's one that I like to share because it has intersection points for folks, especially when we begin to have this conversation about renewable energy and job creation. And it looks like the communities that many of you have worked in, maybe you come from, it's a community that had bad transportation routes. So we know that as these storms get more intense, we need to be able to have evacuation plans, we need to have transportation routes that can handle large amounts of people moving quickly, it has, how many folks are from the South? Or how many folks in here from the South? So most of y'all just visiting, right? <laughs> she raised a good point, because people always say that. I say, how far, or how are you from the South? And we're usually thinking Florida or above. And of course, if you're from Puerto Rico or one of the other places, you know, you, that, that's the real South. <laughs> so I asked the question about how many of you are from the South? And there is a dynamic in Puerto Rico, because I have family from there. How many folks know what shotgun housing is? Look at y'all, I am so proud of y'all. Give yourself a hug. Because I've asked that question some places. One guy was thinking, oh, well, he said he's from West Virginia, so that doesn't mean they walk around with a shotgun all the time. <laughs> shotgun cow housing, you open the front door, you can see out the back door. How, right? Somebody say amen. There you go. And, and Haiti also, yes. Um, or when we talk about energy efficiency, so energy efficiency has been going on in communities of color for a long time. Lots of times people use newspapers around the wind window seals. Some folks know, some folks know, put plastic on the windows. 
Uh, y'all, y'all don't know nothing about that, do you? Y'all fancy, right? Okay. So in Spartanburg, we had shotgun housing issues. Why is that important? For those of you who work and talk about energy justice issues, you got folks paying three to $400 a month in the summertime for their electricity costs, right? We got, everybody's talking about healthcare now. We know in our country, I think it's 20 million that's uninsured and then underinsured, the numbers go up even higher. Their seniors had to travel sometimes about a half an hour to get to healthcare, right? Jobs, a little bit of crime, whole bunch of other different dynamics that are going on. They got a $20,000 environmental justice small grant and have been able to leverage it into about $270 million in changes. What does that look like? And it, let me say this, it is a community-led effort. And why that's important is lots of times we want the city or the county to direct what's happening in communities. And sometimes they may not have the best interests of those communities or they may not already have looked the way that they do. And sometimes maybe they have been a good partner and just the right resources haven't been in place. So now they have new transportation routes. They had brownfields and Superfund sites. Those have been cleaned up. They got 500 new green homes in this community and they lowered the electricity cost from that three to $400 a month down to $67 a month. Now that's important because it puts some disposable income back into people's pockets so that they can use it for other types of things. They got five healthcare centers now and a mobile healthcare unit that actually goes out to the schools for folks who don't have transportation. That's power. They had food desert issues. Now they have a supermarket and other businesses have built around that. That's power. It also creates jobs. There are jobs that are now created in the healthcare facilities. There are jobs that are created in those businesses. And in the homes that were built, folks went through worker training programs and participated in the redevelopment and redesign of their community. Brownfields and Superfund sites have been cleaned up and they're about to put a 35 acre solar farm in there. Helps to lower the emissions that are going into the atmosphere helps to lower people's electricity costs. So now they're going to zero out people's electricity costs and they're creating jobs. And there are a number of other things that are happening in there. That's environmental justice. But lots of times we don't get the opportunity to talk as much about how we are revitalizing and redeveloping our communities because there are so many other issues that are going on that we are trying to deal with. And you can see these examples time and time again that have to be a part of your thinking and the paradigm of where we're trying to get to. So when we talk about a Green New Deal, let's link it to those real world examples that communities have already been doing and build upon that so that we can have real success that's driven by real people that gives real results that people can never take away. Does that make sense to everybody? So I'm not gonna talk much longer. Yes, I am, I'm lying. <laughs> So I want you to think about this. People will tell you time and time again that you don't have power, that you can't make change happen. How many folks in the room, when you were in elementary school, someone taught you about power? You don't have to lie, it's okay, two people. How many people taught you in high school about power in a significant way? Of course Omega did, because Omega was probably teaching the class at that time. So two people. I'm gonna, three people, I'm gonna share with you that you actually do have power and can make real change happen. How many folks in the room remember the Women's March, the first one? So a lot of folks do. Sisters, how many of y'all remember men saying that a million women would never come together? Yep. and sisters said, oh yeah, I got something for you. A million women came together and not only did people march, because sometimes we pay attention to the march, which is super incredibly important to bring attention to an issue, but it's about what happened afterwards and how women went back home and they said, if I can't find somebody who will run for office, I'll run myself. And now when you look on Capitol Hill and in state houses and in city councils across the country, they are led by powerful, intelligent, focused women who are helping our country to become what it's supposed to be. That's power. How many folks remember the science march? Hey, go on. A lot of y'all remember the science march. I was there. And I'll tell you something. It was interesting because a lot of people said scientists would never come out their labs. But they did. Gingerly. <laughs> 
<laughs> they just eased the door open and they were like, is it okay? I said, come on out. <laughs> and they came to march because we had a government that was not living up to its responsibility around science. You've seen in the news, these advisory committees that they continue to strip and place folks who have no science background, making decisions and helping to manipulate policy so that industries that are fading can continue to have a foothold. Does that make sense? So the scientists came out and we were about to march and can I share something with y'all? They ain't have a whole lot of rhythm. <laughs> so I said, left, right, left, right, don't worry about it, just march. <laughs> and folks marched. Now, again, it wasn't about the march because organizations like the Union of Concerned Scientists, <laughs> <laughs> the Thriving Earth Exchange, all these different organizations. <laughs> Y'all know she's with the Union of Concerned Scientists, right? Let's make her real embarrassed. Give her a round of applause. Let's make her real embarrassed. <laughs> Dr. Adrian Hollis, not only with a PhD, but also a law degree. <laughs> Why it's important is because they began to do what many of you will do in the sense of helping to build capacity in an authentic way I often talk about authentic collaborative partnerships. That means that they're not trying to come into communities and take over and tell people they hopefully are honoring citizen science. And if they're not, we need to continue to work with them. But at least they're there when folks in the government have moved away from some of their responsibility because the current administration doesn't place a value on science. Does that make sense to everyone? We also have had Black Lives Matter, people standing up and saying that the murder which it is of black men is no longer acceptable. These unfair enforcement policies and practices no longer have a place. And of course we have youth who of course been part of those, but now are really moving into an even stronger leadership position. You have this is zero hour. You have the folks with the sunrise movement and so many others. And let me give a shout out to the HBCU Climate Change Initiative with Dr. Robert Bullard. Dr. Beverly Wright, who been doing it for a long, long time and been doing it well, who also have to be a part of the history of incredible work that's happening in the youth space. But that's power because people are saying that these impacts that are coming from climate change are not a joke, that my life is going to be impacted and maybe eliminated or shortened because of these impacts and are saying that real change has to happen. You guys saw the slides that talk about all the things that are happening in the renewable energy space, the incredible amount of jobs and possibilities that are out there. Over five million new jobs could be created over the next couple of decades. But you also saw that if we don't take advantage of this opportunity, that there are other countries that will, and they are making huge investments in this space. So if we truly want to be a leader, then we should lead. And that means that we have to make the investments that are necessary to make real change happen. The only way that real change will happen starts with each and every one of you. Do me a favor, look to the person to your left. Some of y'all mad, I don't know what happened. <laughs> look to the person to your right. Reach your right hand out to the person on your right hand side. Let's see how, okay. Some people are struggling, help your neighbor. Help your neighbor. <laughs> Reach your other hand out, that way you can't mess up <laughs> to the person who's on your other side. All right. Leslie, like that dag on Mustafa. <laughs> Everybody do me a favor, stand up. Let's see how talented you truly are. I want y'all to think about something. In all seriousness, you are going to have some incredible presenters who are going to take you deep into the law. They're going to take you into things around zoning. They're going to take you into some of the other types of chemical impacts that are happening. All the things that you need here today. I want you to remember this. Unfortunately, we are now at a time when we have to make some decisions. We are at a time when we have some folks who are trying their best to separate us. And sometimes we buy into that and allow that to happen. I want you to think about something. And let's be honest with each other. Sometimes we will be walking down the road or down the street, depending on where you live in a rural or urban context, 
And we'll see somebody coming and we'll get on our cell phone even if it ain't charged just so we don't have to talk to them. Is that real talk? All right, that's real talk. Or we will get on an elevator and we will look at those numbers and think to ourselves, Lord, please don't let anybody ask me a question. Real talk? We have to change the dynamic of how we dehumanize each other. Because when we dehumanize each other, we allow injustices to happen because it's somebody else, somebody else's problem. That could never happen to me, right? Dr. King said that we come to these shores in different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. Climate change, many of these impacts that are happening put us all in the same boat along with a number of other issues. We have to make a decision if we have power and we're going to utilize it. Everybody do me a favor. Everybody say power. Power. That was just pathetic. <laughs> Y'all didn't believe you have power. Everyone say power. power. Everybody do me a favor. Drop your hands. Put your right hand in the air like it's 1968 at the Olympics. Let those folks in the state capitol and on 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue actually know that you have power. Everybody say power. Power. I'm Mustafa Santiago Ali. Thank you all for a couple minutes. Don't go anywhere. So a miracle has occurred. Mustafa has 19 minutes left. Oh, oh my God. What? So we I'm have 19 better. minutes for Q&A. Put your hands up. Put you your hands up. From Put Mustafa. your hands up. Okay, yeah, let's get into it. I know somebody gonna ask me about the hip hop caucus every place I go. It was Omari. Omega has two incredible sons that I know, um, and one of them participated last night and just broke it down. Um, so we just wanted to make sure you knew who he was in the room yesterday. Yes, other questions? I'm not that good, so I know y'all said something. Mm -hmm. We'll just sit here and hum until somebody asks a question. Mm -hmm. Question. Yes, ma'am. Hey. Introduce hey. yourself, please. Uh, sure. I'm Janelle Wilson. Um, I am studying here at Duke. I'm getting my master's in environmental management. Mm -hmm. um, I know you had a really long and uh, successful career at the EPA in the Environmental Justice mm -hmm. Center there. And I'm curious, what uh, when you were talking about successes earlier, what successes do you feel like were the most powerful, most potent um, in that office and in that capacity that you'd like to share today? Sure. Because it's hard, it's hard to find successes in the environmental justice area, and I'd love to hear um, some of the things you're most proud of. Ah, uh, wow. Great question. Yeah, so I'm most proud of the fact that I saw evolution in the agency in the time that I was there. Um, because I remember, I think I'm, Bernice probably knows the story. When I first started, so when I started the agency, I probably looked like I was about 12, because I just looked super, super like a kid all the time. And I remember I was walking down the hall, and there were two gentlemen who were older, uh, who were walking in front of me. It was one of our first meetings that was actually going on there. And I remember hearing them talk, and they were like, this environmental equity thing, because at that time it was called environmental equity. They said, I don't know why we're going to this meeting, because what these folks are sharing can't be real, and they're probably lying. Now, think about this. These are the folks who have the responsibility on a national level for the protection of our country, depending on what particular area they worked in. And for them to have that mentality said something about how so many of these different types of impacts were actually happening. Fast forward to before I left, you know, we had thousands of folks who had been trained on environmental justice in the agency. That doesn't mean that they were all doing anything perfectly, but that was a part of the evolution. We had doors open where communities could engage with folks. Doesn't mean that everything was always resolved, but at least communities had uh, you know, a, a way in. We had advisory committees that had, over the years, tackled some very tough issues, Brownfields issues. So folks sometimes see the success of the worker training programs that are part of the Brownfields. That came out of recommendations uh, from folks who were part of the NEJAC. Most people don't talk about the history of that and how- And, and what's the NEJAC? The National Environmental Justice Advisory Council. Thank you, Professor. 
Um, yeah, because we use way too many acronyms. The Interagency Working Group. So when we talk about some of the successful projects around the country, many of them came out of demonstration and revitalization projects. Um, and the Interagency Working Group, when done right, has the ability to begin to address the issues that are really happening in communities. Because you have 17 federal agencies and a couple of White House offices. Real talk, White House offices haven't always done what, as much as they should be doing in that space. But that began to focus, began to build programs inside of those other agencies. Because you can't address environmental justice issues just from the Environmental Protection Agency. That is a paradigm that will not work um, and should never be followed. You got to get past these silos. So Department of Transportation. So the project I talked about, a part of the you know, work that happened and the change, the Tiger Grants out of the you know, Department of Transportation, HUD, CDBG dollars, so forth and so on. So I'm proud of the fact that people began to think more in a holistic fashion. The science needs to catch up in the sense of cumulative impacts and synergistic impacts and multiple impacts that are happening inside of communities. And you've had folks who are in this room and in other rooms that have been pushing the agency. And hopefully the next administration will actually pay attention to that because it's gonna be magnified because some of these additional stressors that are gonna come from climate change. I'm proud of the fact that um, right before I left, we had the first and the entire federal government youth, a national youth work group that was focused on uh, environmental justice and climate change issues. It's ridiculous that that had never happened before, um, but we got that in place. Um, but there needs to be youth representation on a whole lot of different FACAs, federal advisory committees, uh, and other advisory boards um, to make sure that you know we're being truthful and honest and, and fully integrative of all the various folks who have expertise in our country. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of lots of things in the sense that we were able to be the first in many instances. But I'm also sad that we were the first in many instances because other programs should have been you know, moving forward. I'm proud of our grant programs. The Environmental Justice Small Grants Program that I mentioned came out of a set of recommendations. I'm going to give you more than you asked for, but that's just me. $25, $26 million has made it to communities, about 1,600 communities. And many times that small amount of money was able to be leveraged or used to be able to get other dollars from other sources. I'm proud of the Community University Partnerships Grant Program that actually helped to establish on a number of college campuses environmental justice programs. Wouldn't have been done otherwise. And if we're not helping our academic institutions to get going on that, as well as our state. So we had the state and tribal environmental justice grant program. Many of the states that now have environmental justice programs came out of that. So I'm proud of a whole lot. Um, but I'm also sad that many of the successes, many of much of the progress is now trying to be rolled back. I don't like the fact that the Office of Environmental Justice was moved to the, underneath of the uh, Office of Policy. Um, because environmental justice is larger than just the policy. It's the enforcement actions. It's uh, you know, all the grant creations. There's the legal aspect to it. There, there's so many different things. Um, so a as happy as I am, I also know there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Yes. So let me add a couple of questions. Please. The lowering of the, um, the actionable level of, of um, uh, bloodlet. Mm -hmm. to a much, much, much lower level than it was before the Office of Environmental Justice and the, and the NEJAC um, got involved in that conversation with EPA. So it's now, I believe it's five, um, five uh, decigrams, um, milliliters per blood. Um, the change in the Uniform Land Relocation Act so that when a community is being moved out of harm's way because it's exposed to toxic hazards, people who rent their homes can also be moved under the federal government. That's a formidable change. Um, uh, the changing in the national ambient air quality standards down to a level that begins to speak to um, the reality that communities of color and poor communities have on the ground. Um, we can go on and on and on about the policy changes, but where Mustafa ended is exactly right. Um, it was very subtle, 
But over a 25-year march, EPA made extraordinary, extraordinary changes in addressing the issues of disproportionate impact of environmental harms on communities of color, low-income, tribal, um, and indigenous communities. Right now, the agency is in a fight for its very existence. So it's the, we've had policy debates before with different administrations about how to implement environmental policy and what is the role of EPA. We've never had people try to destroy the Environmental Protection Agency and the entire environmental protection framework. This is a markedly different moment in time than any moment that has come before in the life of the Environmental Protection Agency. So if you care about anything relative to environmental protection, watch what is happening to EPA and try not to let it go on. Yeah. Keep rolling with stuff. Yeah, and just, I'm sorry, just two other quick things. Title VI never made as much success in that space, um, and now it's almost non-existent. And then NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, which is so critical when we start talking about infrastructure um, as well, has almost disappeared inside of the agency. So I'm sorry, but go ahead. Look to your right, Mustafa. To my right. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Mustafa. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the work that you do and have done. Um, my question is looking forward, right? We're all finite. And even with the best will in the world, the problems seem overwhelming and all around us. How would you prioritize? What do you see as the biggest priorities moving forward? To address environmental justice? To inv address environmental justice, particularly in an era of climate change. Infrastructure. Not infrastructure in the way they're talking about roads and bridges. We have to rebuild the infrastructure inside of these agencies on the state and federal level. The capacity to address these issues has diminished significantly. Um, and if we don't build that, then we're going to miss a number of the pieces uh, to address climate change. Um, so for me, um, you know, we've got to correctly build the structure inside of the 17 agencies who have responsibility in this space. Um, and, and that we could talk about what that actually looks like, but that's one of those pieces. The second piece is we need to begin to strengthen our laws. So we've got some you know, decent laws that are on the books, but in my estimation, there are some gaps, especially with some of the newer challenges that we have, um, and to fully make sure that environmental justice is, is being honored. Um, so we've got to do that as well. And I think lots of people want to see sweeping bills. I think that we can do it um, in a different way in the sense of being very um, sort of pointed in the places that it needs to go. Um, I think that's another way that we'll, we can have more success. And then we have to redirect uh, the resources that are going to be necessary also. And we can talk about what that structure looks like uh, offline. Yep. Yes. So I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your work on the Deepwater Horizon spill and the EJ issues that came up around that. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Yeah, I'm glad you raised that because, you know, a big focus here today is, is going to be on both, uh, you know, natural disasters and man-made disasters. And remember that, especially when we start talking about some of the pipeline stuff, those are going to be man-made disasters. And BP was a, uh, an example along with Flint. Um, so when we had the BP oil spill... Um, folks were not prepared for what was about to happen um, and what did happen. The role that I played, and I was sort of mid-level at that time, um, I got a phone call from the head of the enforcement um, program, and, and they said, we've got this issue that's going on, and um, it, you'll probably be needed for about two weeks. And um, I'm thinking, well, I could give up two weeks. And we began this journey of uh, where it continued to grow and grow and grow in intensity. And environmental justice was not really being thought about uh, in any type of a significant way. So I was given the task of being the lead for environmental justice for the oil spill. Uh, Matty Stanislaus was also there. He was the AA at that time. Of, assistant uh, administrator. Uh, yes, the assistant administrator for the Office of Solid Waste and Emergency Response, known as OSWAR. Um, <laughs> I just don't want to get beat. Y'all just don't know. Bernice will get me later. <laughs> um, so Maddie was the first one, really, who was down there. There was another person, um, because I believe in Real Talk, her name was Lisa Garcia. Lisa was a senior advisor at that time. Uh, and Lisa went down for a quick second. And um, so 
I was responsible for kind of helping to get many of the communities, uh, some of the meetings that were going on to get people plugged in and to help the agency to understand. I also played a role um, in helping people think about some of the other impacts that were happening. And it wasn't just me. I mean, there was all kinds of community leaders on the ground who were sharing uh, and helping a, a bit also. So there were a couple of different dynamics. One of them was, where was all this waste going to go? So they weren't thinking critically about that because when we have these disasters, people just want to get to a cleanup, stop first, whatever the impact is, and then get to the cleanup. So people weren't thinking about that the landfills were in our communities and a lot of this waste was going to end up getting moved and would end up in our place. People weren't thinking about um, the workers who were going to be in this process and making sure they were protected, but also making sure that communities of color had an opportunity to participate as contractors and subcontractors in that space. And just an aside, if you look at most of the disasters that have happened, I would probably say all of the disasters that have happened, and I use this term and don't get as anchored to it as you might want to, the good old boys or good old girls in many instances are the ones who get the contracts and the subcontracts and the sub-subcontracts. And then they may bring some folks of color in or lower income folks to participate in part of the cleanup, but the resources that would help to build capacity and help a business to grow so that the next time there's a natural or man-made disaster that people could fully participate in that doesn't normally happen. The BP oil spill was another example of how that played out. And we've got to change that dynamic also. I can talk about disaster economies and you know what we need to do in that space, but that was a part of that as well. So really it was about trying to make sure that one, the information that was getting out to communities was being translated if it was other languages uh, and making sure that one, people were plugged in um, and had a better understanding that was going on. The cleanup stuff was a part of it. Um, but the really the most important part, and people are still dealing with this, is you know the settlement stuff. Um, that still, in many instances, hasn't made it to those communities um, that were at, you know, more impacted than certain other communities. And that's a dynamic that each time we deal with one of these disasters, we need to be better prepared and more strategic in our thinking about what are the long-term impacts that are going on. And then also helping with, along with some of the health study stuff that was going on and making sure that people had some of that information in real time, although it takes a while sometimes for all that to come together. And the corrects it which Lisa Jackson still, you know, she had to make the decision of that being used to break up the oil and then those impacts and then all the stuff that went down to the bottom. And, you know, a lot of the seafood, you know, was being impacted by that. And many of the fishermen and crabbers and all these other folks uh, who make a living and their culture is tied to this. All of that um, is something from an environmental justice context you would think about where others would just be thinking about what is it their specific job and not how all these things come together um, that can help folks to move more quickly to a better, you know, better space. One last question. Yep. Hi, um, yeah, Makati, I'm a law student. Um, a couple of weeks ago, another law student asked me a question that I didn't have a great answer for. So hoping you can yep. give me a better one. Yep. Um, you know, he was asking about um, you know, a lot of times uh, when when uh, a hazard is moved out of community or decides not to go in a particular community, um, you know, we want to make sure that we don't just kick the can down further to an even more disenfranchised community, right? And so, uh, in particular, he was asking about the incarcerated population and, uh, you know, how many hazardous sites are near prisons where, you know, these people aren't voting, they don't have representation. Uh, and, you know, we talk about pesticides and agriculture, increasingly our agricultural labor force is the incarcerated population working for, you know, pennies a day. Foodborne illness, I think, is like five to six times higher in prisons, you know, in, uh, in New York where, where I'm living right now. We had, you know, things like the heat going out in the winter. And so uh, when it comes to environmental justice, is are, first of all, are there um, movements that you know, include the incarcerated population. If not, how can we uh, make sure that we're not, as, as I said, kind of kicking these problems down to the most disenfranchised uh, groups we have? Yeah, so first we need to stop with this high rate of incarceration that happens in our country. So that's the first place. We just need to talk about, you know, the realness. 
There is uh, a component of the environmental justice movement and a couple of the other movements that are focused, of course, on the prison population. So let me just give you this also. So we talk about our most vulnerable communities. You hear people talk about that language. And lots of times we're talking about communities of color, low-income communities, and indigenous populations. I began to have a better understanding that there's a whole other level below that, if, if we can frame it that way. And there are two groups that I've been focusing on doing a tiny bit of writing about. One is the homeless population. And the other one is the prison population. And the reason that I, I say that is because they are literally trapped. Whether there are bars there that are holding them in place um, or there are other types of structural uh, things that are in place that, that are holding and anchoring people um, in, in the impacts that are happening. You raise about the prison population. Some folks don't know that in many instances they build prisons on the cheapest land, just like they do with some of the other facility stuff that we usually talk about. Yeah, and public housing. Um, and in many instances, they're building on former brownfields and Superfund site land. So depending on the level of the cleanup, you've got all these impacts that are going on. You've got ventilation issues that are going on, depending on how old and the design. And lots of times, there'll be emissions that I've you know, worked with a couple of people where they were talking about the emissions that came in. If it's an old prison or an old jail, you also have asbestos issues, you have lead issues. Um, you have all these sanitation issues with backing up and, you know, all the issues that are going on there. So how do we begin to change this dynamic? One, we have to make sure that prisoners uh, have more rights in their families um, and being able to, you know, work through some of these processes. Two, we need to stop citing the prisons in these locations. Um, and, um, you know, and then, of course, ultimately is we stop incarcerating people who, in many instances, haven't done things that they have to be locked up for. There are other ways uh, of us going through enforcement-related actions in that space. Let me just talk a little bit also, because you didn't ask the question, but I'm going to give you more than you asked for, um, around the homeless population. I want you all to really pay attention to this. Because when we talk about many of the exposure pathways that you know, many of the communities that we've worked on deal with, folks who are living next to roadways and who are breathing these emissions from you know, diesel trucks and cars and all these other types of things, it's just mind blowing when you look at what the homeless population is dealing with in that situation. I work with a lady um, whose name is Kelly Miller and she talked to me about being homeless on the street and the lack of access to clean water, not just for drinking, uh, but also, you know, to, for bathing and for all kinds of other things that folks have to deal with and that people in many instances sometimes will go and drink from, you know, all kinds of things just to be able to survive because now there are so many rules in so many places that won't allow homeless people to come in um, and they bar them so folks are dealing with. So what I want you to just think about is when you think about some of the impacts that you're looking for, overlay that with if a person was in prison or overlay it if someone was homeless and how much more would they be impacted in this, uh, ex you know, in, in this space. Um, and it begins to just get your mind moving to an, you know, a much more expanded way of looking at some of these issues. And that's where we have to get to because if we're not thinking in a more expanded way, we're going to leave folks out. When we talk about, and I'll close with this, when we talk about the impacts of climate change, right? We talk about these severe heat events. We talk about these flooding events, these hurricanes. Think about, as this brother back here raised, if you are a prisoner and they don't allow you to get out of the cells, and we've seen that sometimes, um, and the dynamics that go on in that space. Think about when people are beginning to put their emergency plans together, and if you are homeless and you're not in the loop of where you need to go if there's a bus that's going to help people to get out or a van or whatever the situation might be, how much more dangerous is that situation that you are locked into because of your lack of access? Our communities, communities of color, have always had a lack of access to information, and that's why environmental justice and other movements have been so important in helping to make that bridge and that connection to information. But if you don't have access to a computer, and everybody now puts everything, you know, the announcements and, and all these types of things, then you're even in a much more tougher situation. So that's why I say we have to expand our area of study, um, we have to expand how protective um, our various laws and statutes and regulations are, and we also have to expand whom we're reaching out to and inviting into a situation. Imagine how difficult it is to come to a conference just based upon where you are financially. Now imagine if you're homeless, how would you ever get to 
an event where you get to talk and sit down and strategize and plan about impacts from man-made or natural disasters or just the everyday impacts that's happening in the air and water and land context. So that's where we have to be, is that we have to make sure that when we say we're inclusive, that we are fully inclusive and we're making sure that everybody can be a part of that process. I'll Thank stop. You. So I guess let me say the, the one other really great thing that happened at EPA was that there was a title, Associate Administrator for Environmental Justice and Community Revitalization and Special um, Advisor to the Administrator for Environmental Justice. And Mustafa held that job down for, um, for six years. And we were blessed, and we continue to be blessed. Give it up for our keynote, Mustafa Ali. You now have 10 minutes to talk amongst yourself. Take a break. Have some more refreshments. Um, go to the bathroom. Whatever you need to do, but we will be starting promptly our next panel at 1045.
coming in in another couple of weeks. I've got a good real estate agent now. So can I ask um, Donna Chavis and Yesenia Cuelo and Marion Edelman Largo and Esther Calhoun and Leslie Fields and Ruth Santiago to come and take your seats at the dais, please? Okay, panelists, let's come on to the table. Donna, Yesenia, Marion, Esther, Leslie, Ruth. Donna, you are first. Short ten minutes. I know I turned the sound off for once. You are here. Um, you are here. And Esther here? Yes, and Esther's right next to you. You said it. You look beautiful. Oh, This morning, oh, breakfast. Yes. Okay. Whenever I first got in the morning, I, my daughter got me in the beginning. It came in really late because. Yeah, yeah, I get to meet people. I get to meet people. I get to meet people. Hey, Marion. Nice to meet you. Donna. Donna. How you doing? Okay. Ask me that 10 minutes from now. 12 minutes, the two minute introduction. Give me my coat. Yeah, I was going in seven minutes, so now I feel better. But I won't go over because it's at 10 minutes. Time. I time myself. <laughs> okay, everybody in the back. It's 10:45. Come and take your seats. So, our first panel of the day on environmental justice and disaster response. All women. So, yeah, how about that? How about that? How about that? Let me introduce our speakers, and I want to start with our first speaker. Um, I know all but one of the people on the panel, but I just have to give Donna a special shout out. Um, Donna Chavis from, um, from uh, are you in Lumberton or Pembroke? Pembroke. 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 Um, which is the terminus point for the Atlantic Coast Pipeline and two other pipelines, right? So um, hopefully she's going to say a little bit about that experience. But Donna um, and I have been friends for about 35 years. Mm -hmm. And I met Donna when she served as a commissioner for the United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice and was one of the people who helped us um, to oversee and to produce the landmark report, Toxic Waste and Race in the United States. And so um, the conversation about environmental justice is so grounded in North Carolina. But Donna is one of the people who has been lifting up this fight for a very long time. And I also want to give a shout out to her husband, the great, great, great Mac Ledgerton, um, and one of the true highlights of our very small denomination, the United Church of Christ, how a church that has less than 2 million 
people can have so many hell raisers in it is a, is a wonderful thing, but, um, but I'm really, 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 really glad that Mac and Don and I crossed paths and that they have been on this path for all these many years. Um, it's just a wonderful thing to see. So Donna is with the Red-Tailed Hawk Collective, and she's also on the board of Friends of the Earth. Um, she's been a longtime leader in uh, philanthropy, particularly raising up the voices of women of color and indigenous women in philanthropy. Next is Ms. Yesenia Cuelo. Yesenia is an organizer with North Carolina Field. She's going to bring to us the voices of a population of folks that nobody is talking to, talking about, but is long-suffering farm worker communities um, here in North Carolina and elsewhere. Next to her is Marion Edelman Lago representing the Yale School of Forestry and Columbia um, University School of Law, Environmental Law Clinic, a long, long, long serving, okay, maybe that was one too many longs, um, <laughs> battler, fighter, environmental just, for environmental justice, but for civil rights. She was our first lawyer in New York for We Act for Environmental Justice in 1988, Marion Edelman Lago. Yeah. Next to Marion is Esther Calhoun from Black Belt Citizens Fighting for Health and Justice. You are going to hear some horrifying um, uh, stories about what is going on in Uniontown, Alabama, but um, you are also going to see the spirit of the folks in Uniontown when you hear from Esther. Esther and I were once in a meeting um, with the, was that the Office of Management and Budget? the White House Office of Management and Budget, and we were talking about the coal ash rule, and Esther lit these people on fire. They didn't know, they had never heard from nobody at OMB like they heard from Esther. Um, Miss Leslie, uh, Ruth is gonna go next. Ruth Santiago um, from Comité Dialogo, Dial Di Dialogo? Dialogo. Dialogo, thank you. Um, ambiental, and also El Puente um, in the San Juan and South, um, Port South Puerto Rico office. Uh, as, um, Ruth is our colleague from Puerto Rico, who every time uh, we call, she would come to bring the voice of folks from Puerto Rico. And so we're going to hear what is going on in, in Puerto Rico. And then last but not least, Ms. Leslie Fields, Director of Environmental Justice and Community Partnerships for the Sierra Club. Donna, take it away. They each have 10 minutes to speak, and um, Ruth and Leslie are going to split 15 minutes, so they have seven and a half minutes. Thank you so much, Vernice. Um, and we've already seen her in action, so I'm going to try to stay on point. Um, I have to say, I began with a, um, a prepared statement that I had time to seven minutes, so hopefully I'll be within my 10 minutes. But it has changed based on presentations I've heard. And I want to start first by saying thank you to uh, Jeff Anstead from the Halawa people this morning and to Mustafa, because they said so many words that I had embedded in my presentation that I'm hoping I'll stay on time because I won't have to say those now. Um, but I also want to give great thanks based on comments of inclusion that Mustafa made at the end of his presentation um, to the planners and the producers of this event for the inclusion of the indigenous voice. Um, you heard um, Jeff speak briefly in terms of the um, invisibility of the people here in North Carolina and so many don't know uh, the size of the population here, and I have to say that it has felt so affirming to hear the voices this morning, last night, and to be on the stage today, even though I'm a little more nervous today than I was yesterday. Um, so thank you all for that inclusion. Um, I am Donna Chavis uh, Lumby from Pembroke, North Carolina, and the daughter of Harvard and Gertrude Chavis. I stand on the shoulders of the ancestors before me, and especially those of the original people of these lands who you have heard named today. Um, I want to say that, um, as, as this is not in my written statement, so um, as Bernice pointed out, uh, I have been working in the field of environmental justice uh, for over 40 years, um, actually predating the, the, the title environmental racism, and I appreciate all the association I had with the United Church of Christ with, uh, with that. Um, I, I hail from Robinson County. Uh, Pembroke, North Carolina, where right now we are facing um, um, CAFOs, coal ash, Atlantic Coast Pipeline, and wood pellets. So all four of the major environmental justice um, uh, degradations that is facing North Carolina we have in our home territory. Um, Robinson County is the home of the most diverse rural county in the United States. 
um, and one of the poorest counties in North Carolina. We are a tier one county, as is most of the counties that are along what we call the hurricane corridor and also the ACP pipeline corridor. Um, it's no accident that that is the case. Um, six out of the seven state recognized tribes are being impacted by the ACP and now the MVP. And yet, as Ryan pointed out last night, um, it is stated that there's no disproportionate impact uh, for any population in, t in terms of the, the roots of the pipelines. I want to share with you before I go to my written remarks, uh, and this is for especially the law students. Uh, another comment I made last night as um, Ryan was speaking was that we have such a shortage of attorneys who are in the American Indian law field. Um, it is so small, so much smaller than even those that are in the environmental law field. And so if there is any law students here uh, for environmental law, if you will pay some attention to American Indian law, it will be much appreciated. And I say that because in this country, um, as you know, um, there's efforts uh, every day to make the indigenous peoples even more invisible. And part of that is the diminishment of the territories in which they reside and in which the sacred lands and that happen to also be the home of many mineral sites um, continue to be cut down. Um, some of the first actions of the current administration was to diminish the, natural, the national forest. And so many of those lands are sacred lands to native peoples. So that it would be a great service to this country and to the world, I believe, if some of the environmental law students would also consider dipping your toe into American Indian law, because what happens to us eventually happens to everybody. It's just the case. And I'm saying that from an indigenous standpoint, not just from a Native American standpoint. If you look around the globe, indigenous people are the front lines of degradation. Indigenous peoples are not only the front lines for deg degradation, though, they are also the front line for solutions. And that is what we are finding in our home territory. I want to call attention to two specific things, though, for the law students, and everybody else might be interested in it. One is the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous People, which is becoming the standard rather than um, state or federal recognized or whatever the territory is in the globe. Um, UNDRIP is what it is called, and it is really becoming the major standard for what is being used in relationships with indigenous peoples around the globe. It was used in relationship to Standing Rock, and I, I say that hesitantly because people want to call everything the next Standing Rock, <laughs> and yet everything that happens in indigenous communities is very, very specific <coughs> to that territory, to those traditions, especially to those sacred traditions. And so um, Standing Rock has been informative, and I believe it put the word indigenous into the lexicon in ways that had not been true before. But we have the, I'm um, being told now, I have five more minutes, whoa. I'm sorry, I will get to my written documents. I won't read UNDRIP to you, <laughs> but please Google UN Declaration Rights of Indigenous People, UNDRIP, and also uh, Free Prior and Informed Consent, FPIC. Those are two very important, important um, um, things to understand as we're looking at indigenous communities. Now I mentioned that I'm from Robinson County. 68% of the population is native, African American, or Latinx. Um, we are the most uh, um, diverse po uh, rural population in the country. Since 2016, Robinson County has experienced Hurricanes Matthew, Florence, and remnants of Michael. In the fall of 2017, FEMA put a hold on recovery funds for North Carolina so emergency funding could head to Texas and Florida in the aftermath of Hurricanes Harvey and Irma, respectively. Now, I don't want to imply that those funds weren't needed there, but it's an example of rural communities such as those along the route in North Carolina being punished for being rural. That's our perception in terms of how the funds got frozen. In June 2018, 119 homeowners in Robinson County North Carolina, the hardest hit by Hurricane Matthew, were granted hazardous mitigation grant funds totaling $15.2 million. Over half of the homeowners chose for their homes to be acquired and demolished. And prior to any allocations, Hurricane Florence hit Robinson County in September 2018. Many of the same homes harmed by Matthew 
were damaged or destroyed again. And folks were told that they couldn't really even apply, some were told, because they hadn't done the Matthew applications yet. So we were hearing before in terms of the importance of place and space. And home ownership in this country is important. Uh, and so we're looking at communities along the hurricane route where homes are being destroyed and not being properly serviced through mitigation funds. Um, and in Robinson County, the Lumbee River has only been down four days since Hurricane Florence from flood stage. That is part of what is not discussed. The flood has not gone. The flood stays on. Uh, it's just going over the banks, thank God, and not hurting more homes. But the conversation moves on to the next dramatic incident rather than what is happening in terms of the efforts to bring people back together. Um, saving time for questions, I'm going to skip a lot of what I've written. And to say that um, elements of a community approach that are really important, that are, is not present now within uh, the um, after effects of Matthew and Florence, especially in North Carolina, is a participatory process that include the most vulnerable members of society. Strengthening the capacities of local communities, linking disaster and development issues, and outsiders having a supportive, facilitating, and catalytic role. Those are related to what we have been discussing here, what I have heard at least from last night and tonight, and of how the impacted must be included in their own decision making. If you will Google, FPIC and UNDRIP, you will find that not only it is an important methodology, but it is also a legal important act um, and one that we need to be sticking more and more to. Um, in the response to Matthew and Florence, <laughs> the community people have learned more about their vulnerabilities. They have become in more involved with learning what are the regulatory uh, issues they need to know about, how do they engage in the conversation, and attempting to challenge decision makers. Um, so that what we are seeing is a much more vital and active population post -Hur Hurricane Matthews and Florence. Um, they have become involved with water and air testing so that they can learn more about their own vulnerabilities around their health and how they can hold people accountable in relationship to that. Um, and I want to tell you a story, I'm not going to read it, but this is a story related to one of the early environmental injustices uh, in this country. In, the in 1900, there were less than 1,000 bison left in the United States. Prior to that, over, uh, the numbers had been over 60 million. And during the 19th century westward expansion, there was an intentional effort by the U.S. government to destroy the bison, which was integrated directly to the lives of all the indigenous peoples. And this historically has been seen as another form of genocide. It was bison genocide, but also it was the genocide of the people because they no longer had the clothing, the food, all the elements that was used in the animal. And so in terms of the current day, this has been seen as one of the first recorded intentional acts of environmental racism in the United States of that sort because it was an intentional desecration of a whole population of life form, the bison. Now what has happened is this is a tale of resilience also because as we know now through the organized concerted effort of native nations, environmentalists, conservationists, and even politicians, the bison has returned from the brink of extinction. This is an example of what can happen when an environmentally just practice prevails in response to disasters. Community, culture, and hope can rule. <coughs> Thank you. Mm. I was under time by a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yesenia. I'm not sure how close I need to get to this in order for this thing to work. <laughs> Okay, um, so some of you guys went out into Duplin County yesterday. Um, did you guys happen to go through Pink Hill? Can we get a show of hands of people that know where Pink Hill is? Nice. So we got a population of about 300 people, one stoplight. I'm not sure that lets you know how rural it is. So it's a very small town. If you blink too long, you might miss it. Um, but I am... I live in Pink Hill, but the thing is that I'm originally from California, so seeing the difference in between a very rural community and where I'm from was 
a massive impact. So with the hurricane, I do want to focus a whole lot of what I'm going to talk about today on farm workers and the farm worker population, regardless of whether we're talking about people that have come here with an H-2A visa and Latino people that came here with or that are here without an H-2A visa. Because technically speaking, what we saw was that the hurricane affected people um, throughout all of eastern North Carolina. And I'm a naturally very fast speaker, so if I'm talking really fast, just somebody let me know to like remind me to breathe and slow down. Um, okay, so the thing is, the organization that I work for um, has a youth group, and the thing is that the reason why I'm here as well is the fact that we are talking about building resilience, especially within a farm worker community. So one of the things that we did over this past summer was that we um, and the youth group got together and we help Latino communities start their own garden. So it's all about, you know, building again, building resilience, helping them start their own garden, eating healthy. Um, but with the hurricane, of course, um, it washed out a lot of the plants and a lot of the gardens that we started. So um, that's one of the issues that we've encountered. And then, um, sorry, I came here with a plan of what to talk to and then my nerves get to me and I blink out a little bit. Um, so a lot of what we saw was that whenever it came to the hurricane, some people did, they didn't know about the hurricane, they didn't know it was coming, but they didn't realize how bad it was going to be. So a lot of these Latino families stayed in their homes. Um, and well, what we saw was that they were having to get rescued by emergency and transported to the nearest shelter. Um, so the thing is, what we did um, as a community, because that's what we ended up having to do, was the fact that there was a lot of power in the community, and it was community members coming together, whether they were working or whether they were volunteering their time, in order to help provide services for these families. Because, again, it's a vulnerable community. Um, you have something, you have the fear of retaliation that exists within the farm worker and the Latino communities. Um, so one of the things that I was planning on mentioning, and I wasn't sure if it was okay for me to mention, was that during the hurricane, um, we already know every, Facebook is big. Everybody's on Facebook. My mother is on Facebook, you guys. Um, I'm on Facebook. See what I'm saying? <laughs> no. Um, but the thing is that somebody snapped a picture of a truck that had ice mm -hmm. ran on the side of it. So, you know, immigration enforcement, um, which played a pivotal role in the efforts that we were having to provide just because, again, it's a vulnerable population. I want to say that one of the families that we encountered was that, or one of the things that we encountered was that families and parents were scared to go out and leave their homes and go to the store because, you know, the fear that they might not be able to come back. So apart from, so we had the issue with the fear that existed, and we also had the issue with the fact that it was such a vulnerable community, so there was a lot of, of course, there was a lot of water, but a lot of the roads were damaged as far as, like, access to the nearest store became a bit of an issue. Um, Pink Hill has one food line, so the whole town went there. So, of course, eventually the food ran out. Um, so it literally came down to us having to create a plan, which was actually really interesting, the fact that we didn't already have a plan in place for situations like this, just because this isn't the first hurricane that North Carolina has experienced. But um, it came to, you know, it was NC Fields collaborating with the local community health center, with the Episcopal Farm Worker Ministry, um, along with the American Education Program, so with the school system, in order to be able to come together and provide services, so water, you know, food, or the fact, you know, a lot of houses retain damage due to the water. Um, so us building that bridge is kind of like what NC Field does. Um, so there are resources out there, but the lack of information in the community, so doing a lot of outreach, is going to play a pivotal role with, the with like the following hurricane, because unfortunately, it's going to happen. But um, but we were having to collaborate and come together to create a plan, which was really good. But the thing is, the fact that there wasn't one in place made it a little hard just because you want to, if this organization asks for water, maybe this organization can ask for clothing, maybe this organization can ask for another resource that would be needed for the community. So we were having to communicate through Facebook, guys. I promise I'm not promoting Facebook, but... Um, <laughs> But that's what we were having to do in order to be able to make this happen. But the thing is, for people that the roads were messed up all around and didn't have, wow, time flies. Um, so the people that didn't have access to, like, the roads were all, 
you know, we're all down. There were, there was an organization that did have access to a helicopter, so we could still help provide food to these families. Um, I spaced out. I was on a roll, too. Um, <laughs> we'll do that to you. <laughs> um, so I want to say that one of the other things that we have to keep in mind whenever it comes to the farm worker and the Latino community is the fact that a lot of the Latino population works in agriculture. So like you had mentioned earlier, the fact that the hurricane is already gone, we're still seeing the effects of the hurricane. Um, being the fact that they do work in agriculture and a lot of damage to the crops, that means there's no work for these families. Whenever there's no work, there's no money. If there's no money, you know, food becomes an issue. Other things become an issue. Clothing becomes an issue. And then with the winter coming along, we have to keep all that in mind in order to be able to provide the resources that the community needs. So as far as like building resilience, it really is going to take the community coming together in order to be able to survive, to be honest. And um, I just wanted to come and bring that to the table, things to keep in mind whenever it comes to Hispanic population and the language barrier that obviously exists within these populations. But that's all I came to say for today. Thank you. Thank you. We're also going to hopefully have about 30 minutes for Q&A, and we're going to hear more from her because I have some questions. Um, Marion, next. Okay, so there's been some confusion around my name, so I thought I would just say it. It's Marion Engelman Lotto. Um, there are all kinds of variations, and I answer to anything. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here on this fantastic uh, panel, and I'm hoping to say a few words about two things. One is um, Esther Calhoun and I are going to tag team on Uniontown. Um, Uniontown is a community that received 4 million tons of coal ash in the wake of a coal ash disaster in Kingston, Tennessee. And, um, and so I want to talk about that a little bit. And then I want to direct to the students in the room a few lessons learned about providing technical assistance and legal representation in the context of disasters. <laughs> so first at Earth Justice and, and then at Yale, where I am now, we have the honor of representing Esther Calhoun and other residents of Uniontown who filed a complaint in 2013 against the Alabama Department of Environmental Management, or ADEM, alleging that ADEM, the state environmental agency, violated Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which prohibits discrimination by recipients of federal funds on the basis of race, color, or national origin, and violated EPA regulations by reissuing a landfill permit authorizing the operation of Arrowhead Landfill without adequate protections for health and what the welfare of the community. Uniontown has a population just under 2,000 people and is approximately 90% African American. The per capita income is under, sorry to do stats, but under $10,000. Uniontown has multiple sources of pollution. How many people here uh, watch um, Trevor Noah on The Daily Show? Okay, you know that shtick he does about, we don't have time for that. Well, this is one of those pieces. So Uniontown has a cheese plant, cheese spray fields that emit terrible odors, a catfish plant, and Arrowhead, the largest landfill in the state, with now a, a mountain of coal ash in it. Um, there are very few businesses in town, and because the wastewater treatment center, it's not a center, it's a system, and it's so antiquated and dysfunctional, the town doesn't have the capacity to attract industry. Sewage from the town goes into an open cesspool and spray fields, much like what we saw on the tour yesterday, but for human waste. As, this, um, as at this spray field, broken sprayers shoot liquid fecal matter continuously into the air. So you can watch just spray, spray, and pooling into the air without stop, and liquids, uh, liquid from this, this fecal matter from the sprayers go into a nearby creek and travel into the Alabama River. There's been a Clean Water Act enforcement action about this in the courts for years, but Uniontown has no money and ADEM hasn't given any money either to do anything about this discharge. But as The Daily Show's Trevor Noah says, we don't have time for that. On December 22, 2008, 1.1 billion gallons of coal ash from a power plant at the Tennessee Valley Authority's Kingston Fossil Plant in, in no, that is not the end of my time. <laughs> you got some extra time. <laughs> <laughs> so this, <coughs> this billion gallons of coal ash from a power plant at a TVA uh, fossil plant in, um, fossil fuel plant in Tennessee broke through an impoundment 
and an 84-acre containment area. This was the largest coal ash disaster in US history at the time, and the coal ash swept through homes. As those of you who live through the spill into the Dan River know, uh, coal ash is a toxic byproduct of coal fire power plants, which contains heavy metals such as arsenic, lead, selenium, and other cancer-causing agents. The predominantly white Kingston area was declared a Superfund site, and the Tennessee Valley Authority and EPA, in their wisdom, felt pressure to clean up the site and move out the coal ash. Okay, well the next year in 2009, the EPA approved a proposal, again, this is the wisdom, to ship four million tons of coal ash from Kingston to Arrowhead. Arrowhead is allowed already to take waste from 33 states. That's where we're sitting, that's the entire eastern seaboard. And the permit also has a provision to allow it to take special waste. And under the solid waste law, coal ash is considered not hazardous waste, but special waste. It's very special. It causes cancer, maybe that makes it special. Edom also allows the landfill to operate right next to a historic black cemetery, New Hope Church Cemetery. And now to add insult to injury, the landfill accepts 4 million tons of coal ash. And by the way, this landfill is still advertising to power plants, ship your coal ash to our uh, to Arrowhead. Over and over, Esther Calhoun and others in the community asked why coal ash, with its carcinogens, its neurotoxins, its poisons, with arsenic, boron, cadmium, hexavalent chromium, lead, mercury, selenium, why was this coal ash considered hazardous for purposes of the cleanup in the predominantly middle class white community in Kingston, Tennessee, but not when it came off the train? Not when it came off the train in 90% African American Uniontown. More than 93% of the population in Kingston, by the way, is white, and the per capita income is about three times that of Uniontown. Then there's the basic question. Why was coal ash from ten the Tennessee disaster moved across state lines more than 300 miles away to go to Uniontown and piled directly across from that county road where people live in their homes? And once that decision was made, why didn't dis uh, officials in the public and private sector, the county, ADEM, the landfill, take steps to ensure the strongest possible protections were in place, including strongest standards for liners, the leachate system, leachate disposal, monitoring, public information, fugitive dust control, and on and on. Groundwater protection standards, analysis of corrective measures, for example. Why weren't such measures put into place to ensure that the health and welfare of the community is protected? Arrowhead sits just across the county road from the longtime homes of Uniontown residents who are on fixed incomes. Access to healthcare is different, there's no, difficult, there's no hospital in Uniontown, and residents travel long distances for specialized care. Since the coal ash arrived, residents have experienced respiratory problems, neuropathy, nosebleeds, headaches, dizziness, skin conditions, nausea, interference with sleep, interference with outdoor activities among, I'm getting you depressed. Okay, I'll keep going. <laughs> keep going, but try to wrap yeah. it up. With these uh, failures as background, residents of Uniontown filed a discrimination complaint alleging that ADEM violated Title VI in the issuance of the permit without adequate protections, um, having a clear disparate impact on the basis of race. And the complaint lists some of these harms. <coughs> um, Esther will talk about the land being hard earned, the rural way of life, um, and so I'll, I'll skip some of this and, and the cemetery a sacred space which is um, being desecrated by the landfill. On yesterday's bus trip, Ruth Santiago asked how we reached the settlement in North Carolina um, on the North Carolina complaint under Title VI when EPA has been so poor at enforcing the law, and Uniontown exemplifies her question. We filed reams of support for the complaint, photographs, declarations. EPA did a site visit and smelled the landfill, heard about people's hardship, and yet, Last year, after all that, EPA closed the case, saying there was insufficient evidence that the landfill's permit caused the problems. EPA said its investigation raised concerns about ADEM's civil rights compliance, but would continue talking to ADEM separately. The end, case closed. But it's not the end. The key takeaway here is not what EPA did, though it was unfounded and we're figuring out whether we can sue them or bring other challenges. We're going to keep pushing to make civil rights enforcement a reality in the environmental justice context. But the key takeaway is the resilience of the people in Uniontown. They are continuing to fight. In addition to other lawsuits, Benjamin Eaton, the vice president of Black Belt Citizens, this is Madam President, 
Benjamin Eaton ran for county commissioner and won. And he's now in a position to make decisions about future siting efforts. Last night, Omega Wilson talked about community-based participatory research. And our team at Yale and Sokobi Wilson at University of Maryland are working on black, uh, with Black Belt Citizens Fighting for Health and Justice, the organization in Uniontown, to document the impacts of the landfill. And I have the good fortune of seeing Esther again on Tuesday when we start a 10-day trip to launch a major comprehensive community-based participatory research project. Esther, and, and I need to give a shout out to Lucretia Christian, who's here as well, and the other board members of uh, Black Belt Citizens are in there fighting every day. Finally, just a couple of words to the students about our role. What will be your role as lawyers, public health officials, researchers, policy analysts, if we take seriously the principle of lawyers and technical assistance providers on tap but not on top? In the context of recovery and resistance, what is the role of the technical assistance provider in providing support to communities of color and low-income communities most affected? A couple of quick points. First, you're the conduit to other resources. During 9-11 in New York, for example, people came to us from Chinatown and other low-income communities, saying they had concerns about how cleanup funds were used, saying that they were exposed, a whole range of issues, and we were able to tap the resources of the private sector. You don't have to do it on your, on, uh, all yourself. You can tap other resources, and you are part of networks that you need to make available. Second, keep in mind people with disabilities. I was also at New York Lawyers during Katrina, and, and they, when New York Lawyers has a big disability program. It opened my eyes to the isolation of people with disabilities in disasters. There are people in wheelchairs trapped upstairs in, in high-rises, people with no batteries for ventilators, people whose aides can't get to them, who aren't allowed into shelters. We, as individuals and legal assistance providers, have to organize ourselves to reach out and help. Access to information, this is third and almost last, is critical. In times of crisis, people don't know what they're being exposed to. And that adds insult to injury because people get fearful. After the BP disaster in the Gulf, I had the good fortune of being able to go and work with people, but they were concerned about the use of chemical dispersants, which are used to break up the oil in an oil spill. We litigated information requests, and were able to make information about these chemicals available online. Even work on access to information can be helpful. And finally, part of your job is to be geeky. Enjoy it. Delve into the details and be involved in anticipating problems to prevent them. My last example is right here in North Carolina. The state general permit for swine CAFOs, which we talked about yesterday, has a requirement that lagoons, or these cesspools, are big enough to withstand what is supposed to be an unusual event, a storm that is, only happens every 25 years. But the definition in the fine print at the back of the permit measured that storm according to a 1962 technical bulletin. Well, I'll tell you, storms that came every 25 years in 1962 come every year now. And so it may be geeky, but you need to look in what are those definitions. And as technical assistance providers, it's your job to dive into the details, work with communities to get the word out and prevent problems. In short, there are so many ways that you can get involved. Direct service, planning, negotiation, geeking out, all are in partnership and in service to communities fighting for their own future. Thank you. Esther. Hi, everybody. My name is Esther Calhoun. I'm the president of Black Belt Citizen Fight for Health and Justice. Can you all hear her? I was born in Uniontown. <laughs> okay, I get wrapped in this. I was born in Uniontown. Um, when I was about 17, I moved to Indiana. I stayed there like 13 years. I came back home. My grandfather, in, you know, still living in Uniontown, found that Uniontown was just, just going away, just like all this environmental injustice. But to really talk about my impact, it's like we got to bring to the table racism. We got to talk about racism. Okay, we are graduates or whatever, you know, like we're going to be lawyers, we're going to be environmental, you know, different things. But the thing is, am I going to be the solution or am I going to be the problem? Can I deal with different people? You know, the rich people, you know, like the rich get all the care, but the impact in Uniontown, we're not getting it. You know, have a decent lawyer, we're not getting it. We get the impact. 
You know, like we get the things that other people don't want, especially the black and the poor, the brown. We don't talk about racism. EPA don't even talk about, do they really know what racism is? Do they even know what environmental racism is? Let me explain from my point of view. Having your own property in Uniontown is the greatest thing. And living in rural areas is the greatest thing. But having it and have these environmental people, the, the landfill, which I believe the landfill, the cheese plant, all these things that she spoke about, coming to your area and try to run you out of your, your community. Now, that's racism. How can we fight back with education? You know, with not having the proper lawyers, environmental people. This is where we start, young people. We start right here. You know, like, we don't need to go to get Trump. I know, you know, he's not my favorite person. But guess what? We need to start here, change within our heart, and looking into those communities like Esther Calhoun community, like the people's on the panel community, those ones that get dumped. It ain't just started. We have been targeted for many years. If ADM do their job, which is our uh, state government, if, and uh, EPA do their job, we wouldn't have these problems. Everybody do their job. Step out their comfort zone and stay focused. But what I've been through, I don't think neither one of y'all could wear my shoes. Mm -hmm. Intimidation. Mm -hmm. $30 million lawsuit in a poor old town with just like 2,000 people. You know, like, no jobs. We still have separate schools. But we are human beings. Come on, y'all, we just different colors, but we still got the same blood. We got to change the world. You know, I came to tell you, it ain't easy. The, the Arrowhead landfill went over my ancestors' grave. This is what I seen with my eyes. $30 million, he sued me because I wouldn't shut up. I'm never going to shut up because we got too much out there that we need to be fighting for. <laughs> and we got to continue to fight. But in Union Town, we have so many environmental injustice things like the cheese plant. Smells like a hog, hog farm. Can't deal with the flies. You can't sit outside. You got, you got to stay in the house. That's another form of slave. You know, I, I want my freedom. Okay, the, the, the lagoon. They say don't say outhouse, Esther. But how many of y'all know what an outhouse is? Okay. Well, I, I grew up on the 300 acre of a, a sharecropper with my parents. And we had the outhouse. And we had the wallpaper was the newspaper. So I came from the poor area. But where I live at now, it's so impacted with so much injustice. But then, <laughs> guess what? I heard the new word of a chocolate, a chocolate city. Do y'all know what chocolate city is? It used to be D.C. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, well, it's, a, it's, it's not our community is run by blacks, the brown color, city council, no voice. You know, you go to city council, you're supposed to have a voice. You want to know my impact. I'm just telling you. I just be real because if I don't tell you my story from my heart, then you wouldn't get it. I tell you to come to Uniontown. Come stay with me like the, uh, the fellow did. Robert came from New York, a Mexican, stayed in my house for two months. I walked in the house. He said, uh, I walked in the house and he was sitting at the table. I knew he was cutting onions, but the onions wasn't his problem. He was crying. He said, I never thought to having a, a, privilege, a privilege not to drink water. I got arsenic in my water. We got all these problems going on, but we got all these people graduating, but where are they going? They ain't going to the most impacted area like Uniontown or like South Carolina, North Carolina. It's all over the South <clears throat> where there's racism. When are we going to pull it together? My impact on my life, I got neuropathy. I look at people's every day. People come knocking at my door every day. Like, Esther, uh, how can you help with this? Uh, suicide. No, I know about suicide because my son was one of them. But he didn't complete it. God helped me and he kept me going on. You know, like, just going through all these different things with cancer, kidney problems, no decent doctors. I mean, you got to go 80 miles but no jobs. We don't even have a grocery store. But guess what? My brown people are leading the thing. You know, like the, the mayor's brown. You know, like black. Okay, we'll say black. 
and the city council are black. But you don't have a voice into what coming into your city. Yes, yeah, Senator Booker, he came down. He saw it. I give a shout out to him because guess what? He walked all around the place and he saw how devastating to see. Like she was talking about the sprinklers, sprinkling short, uh, shooting the uh, sewage on the ground. Where do they do that at? Why can't we have a state of the art uh, treatment plant? Oh, they got the uh, almost a million or more dollars <coughs> to get a sewage uh, pipe to Demopolis, like 30 miles. But is that for the resident or this for the the the, the, the industries? I think it's for the industries. It's nothing about the community, and we're the community, the one that need it. Why are they so important? Then we're not. Because we could use the treatment plant, treat the water and go to the sewers, but they're gonna get the money. For who? The people that got money. The who the people that is is really impacting our community. Because guess what? I feel that the the, the leech ain't going right into the the get treated right there. Why can't they have their own? It's never about us, it's never about the poor people. That's why we need you environmental lawyer. That's why we need Marilyn. You know, like, she's my friend. She's the first one that got me out there. But we need people that want to change the world. Until we bring racism to the table, we're going to continue to have cancer. Until you educate your children to not think about that, that she, she's a different color from me. No, teach your kids to play with us. That's what's impacting us because we'll go to school, we'll graduate, but we never graduate about racism. We never graduate about discrimination. Help us tell EPA, look, you're not going to do your job, get out the way. Hey, uh -huh. them, you're not going to do your job, get out the way, because people are hurting. <laughs> Got two of it. But uh, with me having neuropathy and a lot of other people's having neuropathy, like in June of this last year, when the fellow was down, I stopped walking. I start walking for seven days. And being impacted like we are in these communities, it's not right, y'all. Just not right to not walk for seven days, to not know what's going on with, but coal ash is not hazardous. But all these chemicals, nothing wrong with them. That's, that stuff is not right. It hurts me because, you know what, if I, had, if I could be a lawyer or if I could change a lot of things, I would change the way we feel about each other. Because until we change that, until we acknowledge we're no different, and your problem is my problem, stepping out your comfort zone, I tell people, stop up, step out your comfort zone. Stay focused. If you're comfortable, you ain't doing nothing. Once you start being uncomfortable, I love being uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable sitting up here because guess what? I know my grandma isn't prop. It isn't like everybody else grammar, but guess what? I'm speaking from the heart, and that's what y'all need to hear. Thank you. So um, hello, everyone. I'm really happy to be here sharing this space with all of you and this learning exchange that we're having. And so on my way here from Puerto Rico, I, uh, I was reading a book. I'm still reading through it. Um, it's called A Paradise Built in Hell. And the subtitle is uh, The Extraordinary Communities That Arise in Disaster. Right? And so the title of this panel, EJN Disaster Response. So most of you, uh, the author, by the way, is Rebecca Solnit. I highly recommend the book from what I've seen so far. Um, so most of you know, well, I think everyone here knows, that in September 2017, Puerto Rico was hit by two hurricanes, uh, category four, five, mostly five, that knocked out all of the electric power on the island. And you probably know that Puerto Rico is a very densely populated island, and I, I think most people here know that Puerto Rico is a territory of the United States. Um, 
you'd be surprised how many people do not know that we are on the map, actually. We often do not appear on the map. Um, but anyway, so it, the hurricanes um, knocked out all the power, the electric power, and with it, um, a good part of the potable water supply, right? Because a lot of the water um, gets pumped w with electric pumps. And so that got affected. Wastewater treatment was impacted. Um, uh, telecommunications, um, these big companies, these big corporations were not investing in the proper infrastructure to provide service, but charging really hefty rates in Puerto Rico. Um, so about, the estimates I guess are about 200,000 homes were damaged, uh, roofs um, blown away and things like that. And the net exodus, like right after the hurricane, obviously lots of people left because, well, again, I need to clarify, Puerto Ricans, we are citizens of the United States. We were, um, I guess you could say, granted citizenship in 1917, um, right in time for the First World War. And um, so Puerto Ricans, obviously, we we fought, um, or our family members have um, been involved in those wars, and uh, many U.S. wars. So anyway, so um, about 140,000 um, people left and um, never came back. Many more than that left, but many came back, right, after the hurricanes. The estimate, as you all know, and, and Mustafa showed a slide, that um, there was, uh, you know, imagine, we had no power, we had no telecommunications, no one knew how many people were dying. And so when President Trump went to Puerto Rico, he said, you know, someone told him it was about 16 people who had died. Um, but as it turns out, studies have confirmed, although, of course, the president does not admit it, that um, about 3,000 people died as a result of the passing, especially of Hurricane Maria. And, um, you know, roads were affected, the whole bit. Um, and so what happened, uh, actually, was that this was a so-called natural disaster, but Puerto Rico, there was um, a long-standing unnatural disaster that's been going on in Puerto Rico for a very long time. And it has to do with our, with lots of things, right? But um, I guess more recently, um, the economic model, the collapse of the economic model in Puerto Rico. Uh, and a model based on basically um, massive tax exemptions that makes the government have no funds to provide any services. I mean, talking about underserved communities, um, you know, we could talk about the schools, the health system, et cetera, et cetera, that are really lacking. And so this Operation Bootstrap um, created these huge tax exem exemptions so that um, industries could come in ever more contaminating industries as the decades went by, starting in the late 40s, 50s, 60s. And so, for example, um, we had this petrochemical uh, phase, which impacted um, us in, I'm in southeastern Puerto Rico, actually, um, which is where we have the two um, most contaminating power plants on the island, um, the Aguirre Power Co Complex and the um, AES Coal Burning Power Plant. We've all worked on coal ash minutes? Oh my god, I haven't even gotten to anything. <laughs> um, all right, so uh, so coal ash, major disaster in Puerto Rico, right? And after the, impacted by the hurricane, there's, of course, you know, coal ash contaminants in the groundwater in Puerto Rico. Um, and so basically, in terms, I want to talk a little bit about response, so I don't know how talk, I do this. Go ahead, just talk. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, let's see. We have um, this in industrial complex, you know, for example, we have um, about 80% of the GMO agro industry has some part of its production in Puerto Rico, right? Most people know about Florida, but, they, you know, they, fortunately, people in Florida have, you know, given them a hard time, and so they've all come to Puerto Rico, unfortunately. Um, and so, um, so we have a very, I, I guess you would argue, maybe a large part of the island is, is, is an EJ area and um, sacrifice zones, right? Uh, especially southeastern Puerto Rico where we are. Um, and so what happened was that um, it, when the transmission lines from southern Puerto Rico with those big, where the big power plants are, that those transmission lines that um, transport energy to northern Puerto Rico where most of the population is, when they went down, people started doing for themselves because as we know, 
the government did not, was not very present, not the federal government, not the Puerto Rico government either, not the you know, local government. Um, and I remember very clearly the night before the hurricane, um, watching the news and the governor was saying that there were ships waiting, as an island, right, that there were ships waiting to come in to help right after the passage of the hurricane. And I remember him mentioning specifically the USS Comfort will be here. It's a hospital ship. It's going to be here as immediately after the hurricane passes. So, um, you know, after the hurricane, that, that didn't happen. But what did happen was as um, Rebecca Solnit um, documents in her book, not, not, she didn't document Puerto Rico because she wrote it before, but um, how other communities have responded, right? Mutual aid, coming together and clearing the roads and feeding each other and looking for the medications and things like that. And so that definitely happened in, in Puerto Rico, right? We had that uh, mobilization and the re-discovery um, uh, of community that we've lost a lot of. And um, in, the, in the electric energy field, we, we are trying to um, promote a solution that changes our electric grid in a totally um, dramatic way from what we have now, central, big central station fossil fuel energy plants in the south transmitting to the north, to um, what we call rooftop solar communities, right? And the reason why we do that is not just to have a technological fix. We do it to empower our communities, right? And we have um, online our sort of platform um, that is called queremosolpr.com. And it is a, a civil society um, a statement of what our energy grid should be, a, a mission and a vision and objectives. And it's a work in progress. It's not perfect, we're still working on it. We're getting a version three out soon with certain changes that we're making. Um, and we in, invite you to come you know, look at that. And uh, that is, I think I'm just out of time. Keep talking. Okay, <laughs> all right. So you know, basically it's our blue-green alliance. So the largest prep up uh, union is part of this alliance. So what we know is, excuse me? Oh, the Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority, right, which is the um, publicly captured private corporation that we have on the island that generates energy. Um, and although the government is talking about um, selling the generation units, the big power plants, we are totally against it because uh, investors or buyers of those plants will want to perpetuate their existence and continue generating mm -hmm. based on fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. And so we would like to see Obviously, rooftop solar communities, um, demand response um, management programs, and energy efficiency programs, battery energy storage systems, et cetera, alternatives to this fossil fuel generation on an island that has so much potential. And I, I want to tell you that it, although the government, right after we released Queremos Sol, they adopted the one of the goals, our main goals is 100% um, renewable energy by 2050. 50% um, by 2035, um, but they're really just paying lip service. And in reality, <laughs> this is terrible, right? So what they want to do is make Puerto Rico the fracked gas uh, hub for the Caribbean, right. said in, the, in those right. words, right? So these are all LNG terminals, a three um, ship-based LNG terminals that would bring in methane gas from the U.S. and... Um, right, use it throughout Puerto Rico, and also a land-based terminal. And a whole lot of um, new combined cycle, fast ramping um, power plants that they allege that we need in order to integrate renewables. So it's, it's like the trickle down, right? It's like, oh, let's do, they're still talking about this natural, I don't like to call it natural, right? We gotta call it methane or fracked gas. Um, transition before we can actually go to renewables. We know that's not true. Mm -hmm. it, to a very large extent, it is not true. We already have um, 40, about 40%, 38 maybe, percent of our energy generation coming from methane gas. We can go directly to. But it's, it's um, but, it, but you know, that to do what we're proposing would basically turn the system on its head and emp empower communities like ours. So, mm -hmm. You know, certainly we have 
really stiff opposition, although it's very um, camouflaged by a lot of, as I said, lip service that, yeah, we want to do renewables. Yeah, I'll, I'll, down the line, we're going to do, we're going to do this. Um, so I wanted to say other things, but I just really feel bad about taking more time. We should wrap up. And, and electric energy is a human right, and, and energy, energy democracy, but of course we need energy literacy, right? So we, we would, uh, we're, we're partnering with Sierra Club and other organizations on what is known as the Integrated Resource Plan in Puerto Rico to do the fight and get um, some measure of energy democracy for our island. Thank you. Thank you. I'm pushing them so we can have at least 25 minutes of Q&A. So Leslie, bad and clean up. Bad and clean up. I'm delighted to be bad and clean up. I'm really, really honored to be on this stellar all women panel. I can't tell you. I'm just so honored and I'm thrilled to be here. And I thank you so much for this invitation and um, to see old friends and new. And um, I just want to, I'm very blessed. I get to work on environmental justice um, issues with the Sierra Club, for the Sierra Club, with many communities around the country. I am not here to speak for any community. I'm really here as an intermediary, and I'm very, very lucky. And and um, I've worked with a lot of folks here in this room and people on this panel as well. And, and we just got back from San Juan. We had our board meeting in Puerto Rico. And we have 63 chapters, some in our our best chapter is our Puerto Rico chapter. I'm, I'm never like, oh darn, I have to go to Puerto Rico. Uh, no, it is. It's, it's, it's really um, it's very inspiring. And so, but also we have, um, I, I'm here to just um, be the intermediary and talk about a place that is very close to my heart, which is Texas, where I lived for a while. And I wanted to bring lift up the issues that happened in East Texas, in the Gulf Coast of Texas, after te after Harvey, um, and because uh, Harvey was such an incredible weather event, but also um, and uh, Mustafa did a great job about um, illumina illuminating the Houston Ship Channel issues. It was also it also became another man-made disaster um, due to the heavy industrial facilities along the Houston Ship Channel. Um, the numbers of petrochemical chemical plants. Um, refineries, um, dioxin superfund sites, and um, shipping the rail and barge, and people live right in there. The community of Manchester, the, I mean, there are people who live in their houses in right next to tanks. There are toys in front of the houses right next to these storage tanks. There's a fertilizer plant right next to storage tanks. And talk about if there was ever, God forbid, some kind of you know um, attack. Um, that pl it just would be a um, conflagration for those communities. And I also want to lift up, in that whole Texas Gulf Coast, it was also Port Arthur, Texas, the home of some very good friends of ours, um, and then also going down Rockport, Corpus Christi. And so I'm going to read, I have to read a little bit because I can't remember all these numbers myself, but I just wanted to give the volume of, um, the thing about Hurricane Harvey was that it was a rain event that stalled right in the Gulf. I don't have pictures, but basically 60 inches of rain stalled right above from Port Arthur to the Louisiana West Coast, west side of Louisiana, all the way down to Corpus Christi, which is a huge area. And Houston alone is 60, 655 square miles. Houston is larger than New York City, Washington, D.C., Boston, San Francisco, Seattle, Minneapolis, and Miami. That's how big Houston is. So this is just one section. And Harvey hit on August 25th, dumping 40 inches of rain in the Houston area and 60 inches of rain in Port Arthur. And um, it dumped about 19 trillion gallons of, of rainwater. 270,000 homes were impacted, um, 80,000 homes with at least 18 inches of rainwater. It created 200 million cubic yards of debris, enough to fill up about a football stadium 125 times. And the wastewater, 13, 1,300, 1,300 wastewater facilities were inundated. 13 Superfund sites with toxic materials were flooded. Um, and um, basically, it was about $125 billion in damage, second only to uh, Maria and then Katrina. And it really was 8.3 million pounds 
of unpermitted air pollution was released. And a more than 150 million gallons of contaminated wastewater and sewage water was released. Uh, Governor Abbott declared a state of disaster on August 23rd, but many of the facilities did not close, did not shut down until three or four days later. So there was unpermitted air that was constantly still being permitted. Because the facilities were still running, there were explosions. The Arkema plant, which was a chemical plant in Crosby, you might have heard about, and the total petrochemical refinery plant in Port Arthur had outages and explosions. And just from the Arkema plant, 255,598 pounds of air pollution was released. That's reported. Our um, colleagues with um, Tejas, the Texas Environmental Justice Advisory Services, the Paris is one and Ana Paris, and then our organizer, um, Juan's son, Brian, who many of you may know. Brian was out there doing, we got Brian a, a, a um, what do you call those things? A drone. So I was sending Brian a camera, you know, we're trying to get Brian the inf equipment he needs. So he has drone footage of the Arkema plant, one of the first pictures of that that the Intercept used. Um, and then, so all these industrial discharges really are unreported. And then there were a series of high ozone days. Um, but I also want to mention in Houston, I also want to mention, I went to Port Arthur about th four, about a month after um, Harvey, as soon as we could get there. And I drove um, Hilton Kelly, who many of you know, he won the Goldman Prize in 2014. His uh, nephew drove, was driving me around so I could take pictures. And I leaned out. We were driving through the Motiva parking lot, which was still flooded after a month. That's the largest refinery in North America. We were driving through the, the and I'm leaning out the window, and I got splashed by the water. I have a, still have a chemical burn and a scarf just from getting splashed. So that water was so toxic and caustic. And when I, I just see, when you see people of weight, pictures of people fleeing the water, wading through the water, to remember that water is full of sewage, full of chemicals, and nothing, no human living thing should be exposed to it. So now it's all in the sediment. So the communities, just like have been everywhere else, really did so much mutual aid um, and came to, to help each other because the government really didn't. And the disaster relief funds, the CDBG grant funds, are still being held up. Um, you know, Ms. Pembroke talked about how their funds were stalled and then sent to Texas. Well, the CDBG funds from HUD in Texas go to the General Land Office. The person who is the commissioner of the General Land Office is George P. Bush. Mm. George P. Bush is the son of Jeb, nephew of W, grandson of H.W. He's being groomed for better things. Um, so that money is still, they still have not dispersed that money to those communities that need it most. And as you might have read just recently, the money that's supposed to be going to, for general disaster relief, for all these communities that we're talking about, was almost, was held hostage for the border wall funding. Mm -hmm. All right. And so due to immense community pressure from many of you all I know and others, that, that money is not going to be used yet for the border wall. But that is still a problem. That money, if it's not, doesn't get designated, does not get to the state, it still can be used for other things. And it's a real, we still have to lift our voices up to make sure that it doesn't happen. But the money is still, there's so many houses, there's so many people. And just like, I mean, Marion actually stole a lot of what I was going to say, but that's okay. Uh, good, because you have less than a minute. Okay, good. So, but I wanted to say also, um, a year after Harvey, um, the so many great, um, as I mentioned, there was so much mutual aid, so many coalitions, NAACP, um, the Home Coalition. I know the NAACP, Denise Blackbird Ahmed, Abdul Rahman is here from Indiana. I see you, Denise. And um, she, you really should talk, to, all you students should talk to her about what the NAACP has been doing in terms of disaster adaptation and mitigation. And then there was the Home Coalition and also Another Gulf is Possible. The people came over from Louisiana and supported people in Texas, you know, to provide advice and provide mutual aid. So there was a Harvey Human Rights Tribunal a year after um, Harvey. Is that for me? I said less than a minute. All right. There was a Harvey Human Rights Tribunal. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not ignoring you, Vernice. Um, there's a Harvey Human Rights Tribunal a year after the hurricane. 
And there was, it, was, it was held at Texas Southern University, um, hosted by Dr. Robert Bullard, who you've heard about, and you know, you know who that is. And we had buckets around housing, transportation, labor, the labor issues around the workers who were coming in and being exploited. Um, this is disability, the communities who were disabled, and also the immigration issues that have also been um, mentioned, um, how ICE was coming through. Um, Hilton told us about how the Cajun Navy came in and was intimidating people. I mean, these guys, these, you know, these guys are coming in from western Louisiana in their boats, holstered guns, and try, you know, getting very upset that they had to pick up black people too. And that was it got very ugly and very scary for some people. And so there are a lot of ish, a lot of things happen. Women um, are also very vulnerable. Um, older people are very vulnerable when you have these terrible, terrible um, disasters. There's vulnerable communities. Children are vulnerable. Children get separated from their parents. And so the mutual aid that happens because the government wasn't there was incredible. We have that all documented from the Harvard Human Rights Tribunal. Human Rights Tribunals are a very good way of getting this information up. They've done it in Buckingham with the um, Atlanta Coast Pipeline. I want to just say one quick thing that I think students really should be aware of that's happening is that the, along with just these issues, you really have to watch the fact that local control is being eroded, mm -hmm. all right? And that even if a local community wants to ban fracking, they are being um, denied that right in their legislatures. And I know this is happening in North Carolina. It's definitely happening in Texas. So the issue of local control, local ordinances being uh, superseded by state law is a real problem, especially in this um, disaster realm, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm urging your law students and other students to pay attention to this big issue. It's not talked about a lot, but it affects everything in terms of local control, and I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. So we have 23 minutes for questions. Um, I encourage you to take advantage of this extraordinary panel and their expertise to ask away. Um, right? Mm -hmm. And Dr. Johnson? Oh. We got to share some mics, don't we? Here's one. So thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. I just want to direct this directly um, to Leslie, but also the other members of the panel that uh, it was reported this week in LA Times that the Texas DEQ uh, told NASA uh, through Trump EPA, not to fly the plane to do pollution detection over uh, over the uh, the disaster zone. So we see a pattern here of covering up science, uh, and also trying to cover up uh, disaster response related science. I wanted you to um, talk a little bit about that and how that interrelates to this environmental justice problem. Thank oh, you. Thanks. That's a great question. Yeah, we just heard about that too. Um, Brian sent a, Brian called us and said that that was happening. So basically, NASA was going to fly a plane to look at the pollution, and, the, and Texas, you know, um, I don't know if they are going to shoot the plane down or what, but there was, um, they did not let that plane go off. They had, it says, all the technical equipment. They have these planes that can, mon you know, there was no, all the air monitors, I forgot to say, all the air monitors, the few that they were there, were shut down. So here we have hundreds of millions of, hundreds of millions of pounds of air pollution being released because the facilities weren't shut down. They're supposed to shut them down. And in terms of disaster planning in the state of, I mean, Texas has the highest number of air pollution. It's Texas and Louisiana, you know, trade off back and forth. So it was very little difference. So yeah, that plane was not allowed to fly. Um, we're, we are looking at that issue with um, our chapter there and trying to figure out what we're gonna do, you know, what can we could say about it. But yeah, we did hear about that, and it's just another way of denying communities and science, you know, this information. If you don't have the information, then you can't, you know, figure out a remedy. And we really need it because there's going to be other storms. We know this, and that area, the the Gulf, that area, that industrial Gulf area, including from Pascagoula, Mobile, all the way down. Corpus Christi, like I said, they they shut down the refinery, so it wasn't so bad. And Corpus is very flat, and there's, there, the community is trapped there between the highway and the refineries and the port. So all those port communities are getting more and more inundated with emissions because the Panama Canal has been widened, so you have these supermax ships coming through. So the rail 
and the, the containers are, are, and they're also slamming and hurting those communities that are in those areas. So um, we're going to stay on top, we're going to try to stay on top of that situation. Dr. Johnson, and there's a question over here. And this is for any of the panel, and it just occurred to me in thinking about disaster um, relief and how it is um, differently given to communities. Can you all talk a little bit about or any experiences you might have had with those buyout processes and the despair, the injustice between um, communities of color and low wealth communities and wealthy communities where wealthy communities end up being richer at the end of a disaster episode and the poor communities poor? Um, so there's a big land grab in Puerto Rico going on, especially for coastal areas, beachfront property. And um, so uh, actually groups that are working on uh, legal aid related to disaster relief are anticipating that scores of local communities will be displaced from areas that are said to be too flood prone and then um, you know, the, the land will be um, sold to especially, um, you know, uh, stateside and, and, and foreign um, uh, residents. And also, um, this, another um, thing that is happening is that, um, you know, this disaster relief thing is like a big business, and this is not my area or anything, but I did see a, a report by what is called the Center for the New Economy in Puerto Rico, not the most progressive thing in the world, right? But they're saying that 90% of the relief funds so far that, that have reached Puerto Rico, not much of it has, but um, most of those funds are going to stateside companies, and they're hiring people at minimum wage to do, do really shoddy work on home repairs. Um, and so, you know, the economics of this does, don't work either. So there, there's a big study. Um, I'm trying to find it on, um, on Twitter. Well, I, I, I posted it on Twitter, on Twitter yesterday. But a big study in the New York Times, the LA Times, and I think the Houston Chronicle that appeared on Thursday about the differential between how much money, particularly they were talking about Harvey, how much money is going to more affluent communities in terms of disaster recovery funds and how little is going to the communities that were hardest hit. And that, that is exacerbating the um, wealth inequality and the differential in, in the wealth base. So people who had homes no longer have homes, but they also can't get back the same mm -hmm. level of restitution yeah. from the federal government. And that's going to be particularly true in Puerto Rico, right, mm -hmm. where it's not just differential, but there's animus in how those disaster funds are coming forward. Next question. Hi. Um, thanks so much for this panel. My name is Danielle Purifoy. I'm um, at UNC Chapel Hill in the geography department. Um, I have two questions, if I may. Um, so the first is about um, Alabama. So I've done um, some work on um, the wastewater sanitation funding, um, financing um, in the Black Belt, particularly Lowndes County. So I know Catherine Coleman Flowers and Acre and have heard a lot about Uniontown. Um, I, and I know particularly about um, the issue with Uniontown and its wastewater treatment plants and some of the financing challenges around that. I was wondering if y'all could speak a little bit more to that, because I think it's important for this audience to kind of understand what happened there um, and maybe some of the barriers you've had with financing or kind of trying to transform the um, wastewater sewage uh, treatment there. And then, um, and then I had a, a question for Ms. Santiago. I mean, you mentioned um, just really um, just really quickly, you had mentioned the land grabs that are going on. And I had been reading about how those were tied to um, heirs' property um, challenges there. And I was wondering, again, for this audience and you know, just understanding a little bit more about the nuances um, of like why those land grabs are um, perhaps even easier, right, uh, um, in Puerto Rico um, with, the, with the heirs' property issues. Thank you. Okay, like starting off with the, uh, the sewage is like, uh, Uniontown had gotten the $4.8 million from Senator Sewer and uh, Congress late Sewer, I'm sorry, and um, we, 
from my, you know, understanding that the money was wasted because of the soil testing and it didn't perk and all these different things. But at the same time, you got to look at the catfish pond, you know, the catfish plant used more water than the, all the residents in the whole community. And that's the waste of what you're getting that funding for is not for the community, it's for, it's for these industries. And uh, having that done and now they didn't follow the money so corruption corruption plays in a lot of these areas the money is there we got the same engineer they want to continue to use the same engineer with this other money we're getting so it's not going to get fixed until we start in not it's not like we're not trying to correct our elected officials but you can't do that when you got voter fraud and what are we going to do about once you get this evidence and just like we need these lawyers, like once you get this evidence, how can it be, you know, put in the, the right place that these people can be held accountable? So that's where we at now. Now let her get to that legal part because I'm not, I'm just a. We're the tag team. <laughs> so um, just take a step back. So um, there are so many problems with integrated sewage systems or lack thereof in Alabama um, that, you know, just scratch the surface even in Uniontown. But um, about 15, 20 years ago, people were going to file a Clean Water Act suit because of this antiquated system, even back then. And it was already leaking into the Alabama River, clearly violating the Clean Water Act. And ADEM, uh, it, you, when you bring a Clean Water Act suit, you have to give 60 days notice so that the state knows and can come in and bring an enforcement action. They brought an enforcement action, then they just sat on it for decades, You know, for really just sat on it. And so for many, many years, this problem was just festering and there's you know the the system was a non-system and um so terry sewell L, uh, helped to get usda funds and that's the 4.8 million dollars but um and some of it went for a new pump and some things but a big chunk of it went to this engineering firm that decided to build not a modern system but a second spray field and the second spray field was useless and it was really esther and ben eaton who dogged it who just went out there and looked at the spray field, and ultimately they found, though the spray field was certified, um, that they had, they, first of all, they had taken the, the, the feces from the first spray field and built the berm around the second spray field with feces. And then they built a hole in the feces to, uh, because they knew that the, the stuff would percolate up to release it underneath the berm once it started operating. And that was found, they couldn't certify it and open it. So they wasted the money and, uh, and the town was left with this horrible situation. And so there's issues of corruption that are raised, there's issues of the antiquated system, and now, as Esther was saying before, there's this initiative that somehow ADEM has come up with a rainy day fund in another community we're working in, in Tallahassee, where they're there's a suit and there's pressure from the landfill and the town to somehow modernize that facility. But for all these 15, 20 years, they've never used their rainy day fund to improve the union town uh, system. But the landfill um, has decided, I guess, that they now want to modernize the system and put their leachate through the system. So now Terry Sewell is coming up with a whole new approach and new money with the same darn engineer and the same problems. And so it's really, uh, there needs to be community empowerment, there needs to be transparency, there needs to be modernization. And it's so great, Danielle, that you are working on this issue and uh, bringing some light to it, and I hope other people will too. Okay, um, land grabs in Puerto Rico are historical things, right? So um, the big hotels, the resorts have always grabbed especially beach, beachfront areas. Um, land grabs were also historical in the sense of sugarcane monoculture, right? Um, all kinds of things happened to, to dispossess people of the land um, when sugarcane uh, was, was uh, brought in on, a, on that level, right? On a, that pervasive level. Um, and, but what happened in terms of heirs' property, yes, um, we do have a civil code in Puerto Rico that requires uh, it, that or creates a regime of forced heirs, right? So um, with very few exceptions, uh, t uh, people cannot disinherit their heirs. So even if they die intestate or, or they make a will, they will 
have to include all heirs. And so that makes it difficult, especially because of the um, migration patterns that we've had as Puerto Ricans, right? Um, so, you know, my parents migrated to the States. I was born in the South Bronx, but they returned, and but many do not return. And so now we have a situation where about 5.8 million uh, Puerto Ricans live everywhere, but there are certain clusters, right? But there are some in Alaska and wherever, and um, and so they don't come back. And so this in this succession issue, these heirs, um, oftentimes uh, don't don't resolve property issues, um, and and then land lays fallow and abandoned, and you know, uh, yeah, that 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 could be um, prime. Um, property for, for a land grab. Um, the other thing that happened a lot in Puerto Rico was related to this agricultural practices, right, where people were um, brought in to work in the fields, um, in mostly for sugarcane, but also tobacco, um, and were allowed to um, occupy lands, especially ecologically sensitive areas like wetlands that they were allowed to fill, but not given title just sort of this authorization that actually prevented acquiring title ever. Um, I won't go on into all the details, but um, so we have those situations where people can't even get um, federal assistance, FEMA assistance, because they don't have the kind of title that would be recognized um, for those purposes. But we, we, you know, there are groups that are very concerned about CDBG funds, especially being used to displace communities and pave the way for the land grabs. Can I just mention something? Um, so we are, this is another good project for you law students out there. So we are starting to hear, we're getting information or collecting information in Rich, South Richland County, South Carolina, not far from here. People are starting to get notices from the county that unless they elevate their homes, that um, they're not going to see any FEMA relief. And so a lot of this home, this housing stock is not, is very poor. It's, or trailers. And even if you could elevate it, it would fall apart. And even if you could elevate it, you couldn't afford it. Right. So people are, it's also a way people are losing by their land. They'll lose it by eminent domain right. and they'll be losing their land. And we've seen that particularly, you know, in the South Carolina coast for the resorts. And that's been a way to do that of flooding. I think Ms. Pembroke also alluded to that. So that's another thing for local communities are really need need help in and assistance in terms of navigating this and um I like to just like let's you know follow the money right and so that's a way um but if the local government's in cahoots about this dispossession then we have to um go that way but that is something that's going on we're trying to get and we're also hearing from other places like in Texas so this is a national problem um and folks that in South Carolina have, are dealing with post-hurricane um, Florence. So we have other questions. I just want to make a note. Um, there's a model going on here in North Carolina, a partnership between the North Carolina EJ um, Network and the Water Keepers Alliance, um, really trying to connect the issues around the Clean Water Act enforcement and water quality and how that's affected by disasters, but connecting that back to the communities that are also devastated by these floods. So instead of having two conversations going on, there's now one conversation going on in North Carolina, and it's a really extraordinary model. Well, so Vernice, you just read my, my mind. I was just, <laughs> I'd, I'm Elizabeth Haddix from the Julius Chambers Center for Civil Rights, and we partnered with Earth Justice and Marion um, on the Title VI uh, complaint here. And Esther, I just wanted to say to you that, and we talked for just a second last night, but um, when you were speaking, I was remembering when Mary and, of course, we got the breaking news from, from our co-counsel about, about Uniontown. And during that period, it was, um, we were in the thick of it here on the Title VI complaint and on negotiating with DEQ and with EPA. And our, um, so I just wanted to share something with you about that. I remember thinking when we, when we heard about Uniontown um, that we should all just go to DC and shut EPA down and put our bodies on the ground and not let them out and hold them hostage. Um, and, it, you know, I thought about how critical that would have been. I, I, you know, I was also thinking about um, 
you know, how when EPA ignored all of the science that Marion and Earth, you know, that the, all of the good lawyers and scientists and interns put together and sent up to DC with that complaint that we filed around the same time your complaint was filed, um, it got ignored for so long. And our clients were, fine. we were sitting in a meeting, a community meeting with our clients and they said, let's just go up there. Um, you know, they had this change.org petition had started with Elsie Herring from Duplin County leading it up. Um, change.org contacted us and asked us if they could, you know, do this. <laughs> you know, 95,000 signatures in, in two and a half months. Um, you know, they said, let's just take this petition calling on EPA to come down to North Carolina, take it and deliver it to general counsel uh, and, and make them come. And that's what brought them down here. That's what did it. Um, so, I, so I just wanted to put that out there. And I also wanted to say for, to Donna, and you and I have started a conversation about this, but one of the, one of the you know, Native Americans in North Carolina are 2.38 times as likely as white people to live within three miles of a CAFO. And the statistics on the pipeline are even worse. And so this collaboration between EJN and, you know, all the people of color and indigenous people in North Carolina could be just such a powerful thing. I mean, as the, as the lawyer, um, you know, in these meetings, you know, that I'm, a, I'm an, I have an organizer background, so that's what I'm always thinking of is how, pow, how much power you have if we, if we put it all together. And that leads me to the last point, which is Title VI, and, you know, Mark is sitting back here. We have used Title VI administrative complaints for housing, for, I mean, for school education, for environmental justice. Um, you know, it is, it is, uh, I, I am filled with despair about the administrative process. And, and I hear us talking about how critical it is to use it, and that is absolutely true. Because it gives a voice to the racism. Um, it lets us talk about racism in a very real way. Uh, but it's only as strong as the communities that bring it and that keep it up there. And so we are looking at other, and, and the Chamber Center is about to dramatically expand its, its capacity and become a regional um, office. And so we are looking for these, continued these collaborations with Marion and other great national forces in the legal, era, in the legal arena. Um, and that is critical. We have got to find, got to exercise brand new legal theories around this stuff. Because you know the Clean Water Act, these administrative processes, these these um, you know hoops you have to jump through to even get a forum, even get a venue, even get a decision maker. We we have got to break this down, um, and so we're. I'm just inviting people who want to, and we're already working with a lot of our uh, you know fantastic legal minds on the ground here in North Carolina, <coughs> but we need to bring all of these impacted communities together uh, to shape this legal strategy because it has to be defined by your priorities. So a that's great, the long comment. What a great idea. We should talk about that some more when we get into the fishbowl part of our program this afternoon. But what a great freaking idea. I would just say this. Do not despair, right? We have been through darker times than we are going through right now. That's right. I think the part that you left out of your comment is the importance of having enlightened people as regulators. I can't tell you how important it was to us to have Mustafa. I'm not going to say I talk to him all the time, but I might have talked to him on a regular basis, right, about we're doing this, Mustafa, and the folks in Uniontown need X, and I need you to drop the hammer on um, the Office of Civil Rights, and we dropped that hammer. We did, and Marion and I were fighting until the Wednesday of the last day of the Obama administration to get them to do right. And they did right for about two days, and then we got a new administration, right? Mm -hmm. So it matters. What's going on in the North Carolina Ninth matters. It's connected to all of this, right? Who these people are and who they put in positions politically as well as civil servants to do their job. Reich used to be a, an enforcement um, officer and director in Diener, right? You think it didn't matter that somebody who was an environmentalist and who had a, a profound legal commitment to this work could sit there on enforcement actions? It matters. Line staff, it matters who these people are. So this is just a moment in time. 
And this moment in time is going to be over as, as long as we are connected to each other and we are organizing to take back our government and take back our democracy and make sure people get treated equally before the law, right? Omega has the last question. O Omega actually was, he was next. Okay, and Donna will have one of the last comments. All right, thank, thank you. Uh, this, this question is, is kind of directed to Marion. And can uh, it be short? Yeah, it is. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is related to something my brother, who is a, uh, a member of our Western Revitalization Association in Midland, North Carolina, he's an Army, uh, he's an Air Force veteran, worked for Ray Kim for 26 years in California, North Carolina. He raised this question to the um, senior policy advisor for the governor back in uh, October for the EJ Network. And we wrote this and sent a formal letter. The question of the level of vulnerability of these communities, regardless of what color they are, to um, nuclear waste. North Carolina was identified as a nuclear waste disposal area in 1986 by the federal government. They're still bringing nuclear waste. They buried so much in the ground, now they're burying it on top of the ground and wetting it down. We have a nuclear power plant that was almost breached during the last hurricane, by the way. It was on the news and it was off the news very quickly because it's not a Republican or Democratic issue. It is an issue that has a long-term major impact. Uh, and we know what nuclear waste, it stays around a long, 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 long time. And we have not heard anybody formally in my many years except my brother, right, who's brought this as a environmental justice issue that needs to be addressed and put on the formal page because of the level of tragedy that can may take place, Fukushima, Nagasaki, three, three Mile Island, et cetera. And I wonder if Earth Justice or anybody else, Sierra Club, has put this on your agenda to address it, because he was very concerned because of his military experience that we're not talking about some of the issues that must be made <laughs> environmental justice issues. Thank you. Well, I'll start. I mean, we, we really have worked on this on the upstream side in terms of uranium mining on in tribal indigenous lands, um, which is very, very contaminated full, and you're seeing all kinds of um, birth defects from children now. They've been exposed to the water. It's been contaminated. And then, yes, yeah, some of our folks in South Carolina worked very hard against the VX plant that was slated for Fairfield County, which was just simply not cost effective. But the ratepayers and the consumers are having to pay about $600 a year for a facility that didn't even get built. People relied on, um, you know, they built schools, they, they, built, they bought houses down there. So the cost effective part, the upstream, the poison, and then the downstream, and then the cost for the consumer, the whole thing is built on from the Energy Act of 2005, back when Cheney was doing all of that, and they've got $500 billion. I mean, five, yeah, each facility proposal is like $500 million tax subsidies, um, incentives. This is a highly, it's not cost effective. If the taxpayers didn't pay to prop these up, they wouldn't be even options. So there's a lot of ways to get at it. We are looking at a few ways. So I'll just add quickly to that, and I, I am not an expert at it, and I don't know uh, precisely what's happening in North Carolina, um, but I will say I am so glad you raised that question. Mm -hmm. um, we do represent, <coughs> excuse me, um, communities in Chavez County, New Mexico, where uh, issues of hazardous and nuclear waste are very much on the agenda, and um, they are overburdened by a cluster of waste facilities without adequate say over the siting of those facilities, without adequate information in linguistically appropriate um, uh, formats. Um, you know, I think there are so many ways in which these are, uh, the nuclear waste issue is an environmental justice issue, where it's going, who has a say in it, the disempowerment of communities um, by not giving people a say, by not giving people information in their language, all of that has taken place in the context of Chavez County, New Mexico. And um, I will just say, in the environmental movement, um, you know, I was in a new office at Earth Justice that was in New York that, uh, that was only a couple years, open, uh, um, couple years open when I got there. 
and we sat not far from Indian Point. And Indian Point in New York is an aging uh, nuclear power plant that is going to be retired. Cuomo re announced it's retired in 2024, some, some future date. It should have been retired long ago, in part because there is absolutely no way to evacuate that region. You're talking about the New York metropolitan e region. 25 million people. It is, and it's right near Asining. I mean, it's Sing Sing. It's, it's a ridiculous place, and yet it's not sufficiently on the agenda in the Green Movement. And part of it is the concern that um, people are focused on climate change rightly, but that doesn't mean we abandon the fight about high-risk activities and where waste is going and the lack of say by people who are affected. So I'm, I'm really thankful that you raised the issue, and I think it should be higher on the agenda, and I share your concern. I'd love to talk more about it. Yeah, I would just say that the, the Western Shoshone um, tribe and the Navajo <coughs> have been throwing down about this issue for decades, but they have really been the tip of the spear in really throwing down about these issues. But what is the role of tribal governments in relationship to the Department of Energy about storage and disposal? So while we're all sitting here, um, and while we've been traveling here, this current administration is making decisions about storage bypassing the NEPA process and bypassing the public comment process and just going ahead and making decisions and storing nuclear waste and spent nuclear fuel rods. So, you know, when I, um, I try to be neutral, and most days I'm, I'm pretty good at being a neutral facilitator, but these people are evil, right? This, it's not just that I disagree with them, it's that they're evil and they really think that nature is a finite um, resource, which we all know it is not, right? So the, 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 cataclysm that we're facing by people making bad decisions and uninformed decisions and, and decisions based on who gets money and who gets contracts is really going to cost a lot of us our lives. And so we need to be linked up, as Elizabeth said, and thinking about creative strategies and also tearing down the barriers that have kept us separated one from another. I'm sorry, but I'm going to forego your, your question, but I hope you will come up and ask them. Give Donna the last word, and then we're going to break for lunch. Okay. And can, am I close enough? Uh, actually, I'm hoping that this will be uh, ending on a more positive note. But thank you, Vernice, for uh, raising up the ongoing battle that's been going on around nuclear, and thank you for asking that question. Um, one thing that struck me as a unifying point for all of us was the, uh, um, the encouraged benefit of mutual aid in our communities as we face these disasters and continue to face. And hearing the conversation with questions, I would add that we're also raising up the need for us to have the mutual aid society within our organizational structure. And that's happening on some levels, and it's increasing in some and getting less in others, which will always happen. But I think we should remember Remember that it's not just in local communities, but within our ongoing organizing work that we need to be mutual, mutual aid societies. But I want to I want to say this uh, because whenever I'm putting together a presentation like this, the thought passes through my brain every time, and it's a quote that said, and I almost believe it's propaganda, where we hear over and over again, "We're better than this." How many times have we all used that? Raise your hands if you've ever used, "We're better than this." Okay, speaking as an indigenous person, I don't believe we're better than this. I believe that this country is founded on this, that fake news didn't start with Donald Trump being the originator of fake news himself, but fake news started with the colonization of these lands from day one. Yeah, yeah. So we are not better than this, but we can be better than this. I hope that that's what we take out of here that we can be and we have been, as Vernice so, said so well, we can be and we have been better than this and so that we don't lose the encouragement of our day-to-day -day work, that we remember there's a mutual aid society that's in this room and elsewhere and that we can be and have been better than what we are right now as a nation, not as individuals, but as a nation. That was it. Thank you. Thank you. Can you please uh, join me in just thanking this extraordinary panel of women for bringing this, huh? Thank you. Thank you. This is just, this is just a little, little, little teeny insight into the work that these extraordinary, that these, this is my job today is as facilitator. 
But this is just a small fraction of the extraordinary work that these folks are doing and the organizations that they've been a part of and how long they've been at it. So I would just say to the young people, if you do not want to be in a battle for justice for a really long time, this ain't the work for you, right? <laughs> but if you can see the horizon and your heart gets filled, by doing work on behalf of other people to bring about justice, to enforce the law, to make sure that people are treated equally, then we have a spot for you. But if it's not about the long goal, this, this is not the conversation for you. But if you want to hang, you can hang with Donna for 40 years, right? You can hang with other folks who've been at this their entire careers, right? We were all organizers, right? We were, we were the college radicals, you can tell, right? And we're still raising hell, and I'm just saying to you, Hellraiser forever if you want to join this fight. Time for lunch. And we will be starting on time at 1.15. So eat now. You have announcements?